Okay, that's nice, good. Okay, uh, let us start. Uh, let us kick off the workshop. Thanks again, everybody, for for joining. This is the fifth precognition workshop. Um, we've we've organized it for four years and for the last uh, four P CPRs, and we'll see a little, a little bit about that uh, history. But this is our our um, how to say that like fifth uh, jubilee. And I was really happy. I'm really happy to see everybody here, and that we're continuing with with strong program, with strong uh, invited speakers, very strong papers, and uh, let's see what we what we have uh, in store. As I said, this is the this is the fifth um, our workshop. The first one was 2019, a long time ago, Long Beach, and then followed by two virtual workshops during the the COVID times. And finally, last year we again reconvened in, in person in in New Orleans. And all four all four workshops previously uh, they were very well attended, both uh, live and remote. And we have we have quite a lot of uh, had quite a lot of good uh, talks from the industry and from the from the academia. And same same goes for this uh, this time around as well. We'll see very very good. Uh, uh, We'll see what's uh, what the latest research from from various parts of the of the industry there where precognition is is, is important. Uh, here are some uh, uh, pictures from a long time ago. Uh, we prepared the will. We we're starting to make new pictures now that we're we are again live. So next time, uh, hopefully, you'll see your your, your own faces in, in a slide like this. Uh, these are the organizers. So let me actually see if I can hide this. If I can hide this. Uh, that's actually worse. Okay, it's gonna disappear, I think. So th these are the organizers of uh, this year's workshop. We have Koa, myself, Chris, Utsav, Hien, and Yunwei. Uh, here, uh, here in the in the room, we have um, Chris, Utsav, and and myself. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, stop by and ask questions to the organizers. Uh, the other organizers also were planning to join us uh, in person, but various things stopped them from doing so. Um, although you will see um, some of them also uh, at the CDPR, although, although not today. Uh, we also wanted to acknowledge the program committee. Without them and without their their um, uh, very hard work and really great reviews on the except on the papers that were submitted, we wouldn't have uh, these uh, such a strong program. So these are the program committee members from from various companies and from a uh, mix of academia and and uh, uh, industry. And we really huge thanks to them. Without them, this really would not be possible. I mentioned that we have a very strong invited uh, speaker um, lineup. So we'll have uh, Yunju, Varun, Wei Song, and, and Juan Carlos presenting presenting today. Um, we have a mix of talks from from uh, various parts of the of the computer vision field, and hopefully you you enjoy it. And please do ask questions as as uh, as these talks uh, go on. Um, I'm sure it is quite exciting to hear what's what's uh, what are the latest uh, research uh, that these folks have been working on in the last year. This is the schedule. We had a poster session started at 11:30 and finished uh, five minutes ago. Hopefully, you also had time to check it out. Uh, we had we had a couple of um, we had uh, we have a mix of eight uh, full papers accepted and three extended abstracts. Uh, in today's session, we'll see the presentations from from these eight uh, full speak, full talks, and in poster session, you also had opportunity to see the three extended abstracts. Uh, we're starting with opening remarks. Then we'll have invited talk by Yun Zhu. Uh, then lightning talks, three full papers, followed by invited talk by Varun. Uh, then lightning talks again by again three papers, uh, followed by invited talk by Wei Song. Uh, finally, we'll closing out the full papers with those, the final third uh, Latin talk uh, session, and uh, Juan Carlos will be closing out the the um, the program for today with invited talk at, at 4 p.m. 
Uh, I mentioned the poster sessions. We had a we have eight full papers accepted and three extended abstracts. These are the extended abstracts that uh, that uh, the posters uh, that we had a, uh, featured in the poster session. If you would like to check check these out, feel free to find the. Uh, there, there will be no presentations uh, on these extended abstracts. However, feel free to find uh, the authors and also at the at the very end at the our workshop at our uh, web page for each of these abstracts and as also full papers as well. We'll have the video presentations posted and also the uh, the slides and the posters themselves. So after the workshop, sometimes tonight, uh, you, you'll be able to also access the, this uh, presentation material. First couple of technical items. Workshop will be mostly in person. Uh, we do have one remote invited talk and one recorded talk where this recorded talk will, will have a live Q&A. Uh, we also have Zoom streaming and Zoom attendance. So while we are while we're balancing between the, the, the uh, Zoom and live, uh, thanks for bearing with us as we're, as we're, as we're trying to balance uh, both sides of the attendance. Uh, when it comes to presentations, uh, I mentioned we'll have uh, four invited talks. There'll be 30 minutes for talk and then five minutes for questions. And finally, for accepted talks, there'll be eight of them, seven to eight minutes for talks plus two minutes for questions. If you want to ask a question, please do so. There'll be live questions. Just raise your hand and uh, we, can do, we can do that. If you're on Zoom, then please post a comment to the chat and then we'll, we'll monitor Zoom and uh, repeat these questions. There is also option to ask questions in, in Rocket Chat through the live live um, platform on a remote platform on CVPR. Uh, but ideally, let's use Zoom just so we have to balance again three different platforms for asking questions. And for speakers, please always repeat the received question. So we, we make sure that everybody on Zoom and here uh, understands um, what's the question. And uh, yeah, let's uh, kick it off. What's up? Thanks, Armando. Uh, so our first invited speaker is Dr. Yunzu Li. Uh, Yunzu is a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University. He's working with Dr. Fei Li and Professor uh, Jia Jun Wu. Uh, he received his PhD from uh, MIT, and he is he will be joining the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, later this this year. Uh, his work stands at the intersection of robotics, computer vision, and machine learning with the goal of helping robots perceive and interact with the physical world as dexterously and effectively as humans do. Uh, you know, he's received many awards. His work has been published in top journals and conferences and, you know, showcased in many media, major media outlets. So let's, let's welcome you to I'll stop sharing. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. So really appreciate the kind introduction. Thank you so much. And I'm really excited to be here to talk about some of my recent work on learning structured word models from and for physical interactions. And the overall goal of this today's talk is that by the end of my talk, you'll be convinced that we should add structure to our learning systems. And with a suitable choice of structures in the systems, we'll have much better sample efficiency and generalization capabilities, especially for complicated physical interaction tasks in the real world. And today I'm going to showcase examples of manipulating, for example, dove, granular objects, as well as crafting dumplings. And it's all uh, uh, thanks to the structures we add to our dynamical systems that can predict the futures and help us to do plannings uh, in the real world. So the North Star of my research is to build robotic manipulation systems that can achieve human level manipulation capabilities. 
And although we have robotic manipulators currently deployed in the industry for commercial use, they typically handle relatively simple objects for peak and place tasks. Yet we humans can perform much more complicated manipulation tasks. For example, we can crack eggs, spread butter on a slice of bread, making dough and sushi. All of these capabilities goes far beyond of what's possible using the current robotic systems. So I would like to argue that one of the key enabling factors of why we humans can perform these tasks is this intuitive models of the world. That we can predict how the environment would change if we apply a specific action. For example, looking at the following two videos, although the manipulating objects are very different from each other, one is dove and the other is a pile of onions. We can effortlessly predict the effect of our actions. For example, how the dove will deform and how the onion pieces will move around. The predictive ability then help us plan our behavior in order to achieve a specific goal. And to build such a predictive models, there are generally two ways of doing it. One is to learn the model from data. We can roughly categorize it as model-based reinforcement learning. The typical framework typically maps observation into a latent space Z, and then learn a dynamics model predicting the evolution of the latent space. You can learn directly from partial observations and handle systems where the underlying dynamics is uncertain or unknown. We have success stories, for example, like Mu Zero and controlling robots from pixels. However, most prior work typically assume that Z is one dimensional vector, which is unstructured and limited in terms of generalization. For example, when looking at the Play-Doh or a pile of coffee beans, we humans are not thinking of them as just one single latent vectors. We can recognize the constituting components and the relational structures between them. And it's exactly the structured understanding of the environment that allows us to handle objects and systems with complicated physical properties and complicated interactions. Talking about structure, the other way to build a predictive model is based on analytical physical equations like F equals MA. This is arguably the most compact ways to encode the structures and has excellent generalization. It is also extremely useful in constructing models, for example, for Boston Dynamics robots and rockets. However, such physics-based model relies on the assumption that full state information is available, which is often not the case for complicated physical interaction tasks. For example, in the onion piece manipulation tasks, estimating the states of each and every one of the onion pieces is very hard and sometimes impossible. Or for the short bottling task, although uh, we humans can only manipulate and do this task based on local information, but we want to have a simulator and simulate this whole process, we need to know the full state of the clothes before we can use the physics-based model to uh, model the interactions. So both methods have their pros and cons. The left is model learning, while the right is structures in the model. My research aims to bridge the gap and get the best of both worlds, then learn models from the robot's interactions with the environments. We want to add structure to the model, then capture the compositional structures of the underlying physical systems. And the agents learn from the interactions and use this learned model to do better physical interactions in the real world. To make the problem more concrete, we aim to minimize an objective function C, defined over the observation Y and the action U. And we have to think through three most critical constraints. The first one is a perception module that essentially maps the observations into some scene representation Z. Then is a dynamics module that predicts the changes in the scene representation when given an external action. Then is a control module that derives the control signal based on the scene representation to minimize the task objective. If you look closely at this problem formulation, you realize that the choice of scene representation Z has a profound impact on the design of all components throughout the entire system. Thus, it is of paramount importance to think carefully on what kind of representation we should use for a given task and understand its implications about the system structure. I will show how a suitable choice of representation and structure can lead to better generalizations and sample efficiency. And for this specific talk, I'm focused on the use of particle as a representation. Particle as a representation is a very general representation and is very flexible in terms of representing objects of wide variety of materials, like rigid objects, deformable objects, and fluids. As you can see from the images, different objects consist of particles, which indicates object geometry 
and the interactions within and between the objects. And to model the dynamical system represented using particles, we are using graph neural networks. Here is a graphical illustration of how graph neural networks work. This graph contains three nodes and three directed edges, which together is our theme representation Z. For each directed edges in the graph, we denote the sender as B and the receiver as A. An edge encoder takes the information on both the sender and receiver and outputs an edge representation, which we denoted as EK. Then for each node, we aggregate all the edge representation on edges where node A is the receiver. Their aggregation is then combined with the information on node A to derive the node representations in the next time step. We can then define the loss function between the nodes or edge representation and the quantity we care to supervise the model. In our specific case, what we care is the evolution of the state. Hence, the loss function is a mean squared error between the node representation and the actual state at the next time step. One thing to note here is that we exploit the compositional nature of the system, where the node encoder is shared among all nodes and the edge encoder is shared among all edges. Thus, a nerd model can generalize naturally to systems of different sizes or even outside the training distribution, as we will show later in the experiments. Using the graph neural dynamics models, we'll be able to model systems, for example, here, two fluids fall down and merging with each other, where the left is a ground truth and the right is our model's open loop prediction. By open loop, I mean that the input to our systems are only the initial states of all particles. And one predicts how the particle is going to evolve um, for a very long uh, future horizons. As you can see from the video, the prediction is very close to the ground truth. Here's another example where we grip a deformable materials using two cuboids, which are to mimic the two fingers of a parallel gripper. Here we show some other examples of shake a box of fluids. We're assuming here that the container is fully actuated. Our model accurately predicts the long horizon future by taking in the particle state at the first frame and the subsequent actions for control containers movements. As we have discussed before, all nodes share the same node encoder and all edges share the same edge encoder. So our system can naturally generate systems with more particles than during training. This example shows that our model can work in an environment containing two times more particles than during training. It is clear from the video that our model captures the wave of the fluid particles and um, it can also maintain the density and incompressiveness constraints of the fluids. After we have obtained a dynamics model, how can we use it for the control tasks? In this work, because the NERD model is a neural network, which is naturally differentiable, which we can extract the gradients using off-the-shell packages like PyTorch and TensorFlow. We can then using gradient descent to optimize the action signals and apply a model predictive control framework to account for the modeling error. More specifically, here we use the blue dots to represent the initial state of the systems. The goal is to achieve the target shown in red. We have an initial guess of the action sequence and use the learned model to predict the control outcome. We then define a loss functions that describes the distance between the predicted outcome and the targets, and then back propagate the gradients of the loss function with respect to the action sequence. We then iteratively update the action sequence to minimize the distance between the predicted outcome and the target. The model may not be accurate enough because it's a data-driven model. So we use model predictive control, where we only execute the first action U0. The environment will give us a new state, the U1. We then re-optimize the action sequence, again, using gradient descent to give the model an opportunity to adjust its action sequence to account for the prediction error. And this is essentially a shooting method if you are familiar with um, control. And the key to the success of this method is to leverage the parallel computing power of GPUs, where we can sample hundreds or even thousands of action sequences at the same time and do gradient descent for all of them simultaneously. This allows the planned trajectory to perform local refinements and at the same time, get around some local optimum. And here we show some models control results. The goal here is to shake this box of fluids where the control signal is the position of this fully actuated container. We want the shape of the fluid to match the shape shown on the top left when the countdown goes to zero. And here's the control process. And here's the results. 
Here's another example. It's clear from the video that our model's dynamics prediction capability can help the container minimize the distance between the end states and the targets. Here we show the control results in manipulating a deformable form. The decision variable here is the position, orientation, and the clipping distance of the parallel gripper. And after two grips, the result roughly matches the targets. Here's another example. And after a few grips, it is much closer to the targets. We have also generalized the learned model to the real world by manipulating a deformable form uh, in the real world using a real robot. Here we show two examples of manipulating these forms into our target shapes. The first row is a T-like shape, and the second row is a tilted shape. After a few grips, the shape is getting closer to the target. And the key to the success of this method is to conduct real sim to real transfer, where the model is learned using a physics-based simulator. And in order to transfer to the real world, we use 3D reconstruction to obtain the shape data and online adaptations to estimate the physical parameters, such as stiffness. This raises the question of whether we can eliminate the reliance on the physics-based simulator, because we do not have a physics-based simulator that can simulate everything around us. And we are also asking whether we can directly learn the model from real data, because we do not have simulators. Everything needs to from the interactions and from the data where the robot is obtained through its interactions with the real environment. And we are also asking, can we move to some more complicated tasks? I'm from China. So given that I already work on the manipulations of elastoplastic objects, so I thought, why not try to make some dumplings? Let's see how well we can proceed using real data without relying on physics-based simulations to learn neural models that allow us to make a dumpling. Making dumpling is no easy task. We have to, once again, work with elastoplastic objects that possesses extremely high degrees of freedom. Simultaneously, we must account for excessively large deformations in the dumpling making process and handle instances involving the splitting and merging of materials. In addition, this is also a long horizon task that requires the use of a series of cutting, modeling, and clamping tools. It necessitates the agents to make both discrete decisions on which tool to use and the continuous decision on what specific action to take. To construct a robotic system capable of tasks as complicated as dumpling making, we first design a tool set, re referencing tools commonly in, used in our daily life in our kitchen environments. We included 15 3D printed tools consisting of grippers of various shapes, as well as rollers, uh, pressers, and cutters, and spatulas of different sizes. The tool set incorporates both non-actuated tools like presser, where the pressers will move together with the movements of your end effectors. It also contains actuated tools like grippers and spatulas, where we are using the fingers of the end effectors to control the openness and closeness of these different tools. We then design a tool switching system capable of efficiently transitioning between the tools. Here, as marked by the white ellipses, are four RGBD cameras we use to observe the environment to get a 3D reconstructions of the dove we are manipulating. And this red rectangle indicates the workspace we are working in. Here we have the dumpling making process. What's particularly interesting about this video is the presence of a human persistently perturbing the robot, hindering the progress. We demonstrate the robustness of our proposed framework during real-time executions in this video. Let's begin. After the robot cuts the dough, the human puts the excess dough back. The robot knows it needs to cut again um, to get the right volume. Then the human grips the dough into some irregular shapes. But the robot can still actually achieve the next sub-targets with guidance from a self-supervised nerd policy network. Yep, and the robot, then the robot grip again, then the human is constantly uh, making perturbations. And then it's a presser. After the robot presses the dough, the human pinches the dough into, for example, a lumpy shape and adds stuff to it. And the robot realizes you have to press multiple times to flatten it. Next is rolling. After the robot rolls two times, the robot folds the flattened dough into a thicker shape. 
the robot's rows again to ensure that robot surface area is large and flattened enough to cut a circle out of it. After the, the robot cuts out the circle dumping shape, this is where things get interesting. Here, the human shows no mercy and destroy everything the robot has just accomplished. And the robot puts down the roller and pick up the knife to start again from the beginning, demonstrating the robustness and the, I dare say, the patience of our framework in the face of heavy disturbance. The robots then use a pusher to push away the excess dough. Next, we have the, then we have the dumpling skin ready. Then the robots will use a spatula to move the skin into the dumpling clip. And then the robots will use a spatula again to put the uh, fillings onto the dumpling skin and use a hook to, um, to move the handles uh, to press, uh, to close, press, and open it to finish the dumpling, dumpling making pipeline. What's enabled this demo is the closed loop control system that takes the current observation on the left and the targets as inputs. And we have a classifier that is trained to predict what tool to use at this current stage, which essentially making a discrete decision and conditioned on the selected tool and the observation and the target of, of course, a policy network determines the specific action to take. And after the robot took the action, uh, the environment will change and then new observations is gonna feed back to our interaction systems to close this uh, perception and action loop. We utilize a self-supervised learning approach to learn the policy. And at the core of this self-supervised learning procedure is a learned dynamics model instantiated as a graph neural network operated on this particle-based representation that's used to represent the dough. And this graph dynamics model is exactly the same as what I described in the first project. The learned dynamics model functions as a simulator, or you could also think of it as a generator. This enables us to distill a policy for efficient feedback control during testing. And on the bottom right, you'll be able to see that we are using different types of parameterizations for different tools, but we are using the same uh, representations using the particle to represent the geometry of the tools and the dough to model the, to model the system. Most specifically, uh, this graph neural dynamics model takes the current observation again, similarly as inputs and iteratively predicts the future states conditioned on the input action. And we represent the current state using the point clouds of both the dough and the tool, which allows for a more accurate modeling of the geometry and their interactions. Here we present a comparison between the ground truth and the long horizon future prediction results obtained using our nerd dynamics. The first row dis displays uh, the prediction while the second row uh, presents the ground truth. And you can see from the image, our nerd model accurately captures the geometric deformations uh, of the dove, laying a solid foundation for the model to learn a policy on top of it. Here is another example of using uh, pressors to deform the, to make the, 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 the thickness of the dove uh, thinner. And one very important point I want to emphasize here is that thanks to the structures we introduced using the particle representation and the graph neural network. Remember, the node encoder is shared among all nodes and the edge encoder is shared among all edges, which is essentially a sparse structures where the number of parameters we need to learn doesn't scale with the size of the systems. It only scales with the type of edges or type of nodes in your systems. So you can naturally generalize. So that's why with just 20 minutes of real world interaction data for each tool, we can learn a reasonably accurate dynamics models. And it is noticeably more accurate than physics-based simulators, even if we apply very extensive system identification. Our proposed framework can also be applied to perform other tasks, for example, such as shaping the dough into complicated letter shapes. Highlighted in the middle uh, by the red rectangle is the manipulation results of manipulating this uh, deformable dough into letter shape like R, O, B, uh, C, and K. And it's together will spell out the name of our project like RoboCook. The right side of the figure displays the results from the baseline. 
which demonstrates significant larger deviations from the targets. Here, we provide quantitative comparisons between our method and the baseline. Our method consumes the least amount of time and achieve significantly higher performance as measured by human studies. We ask the human, can you recognize this letter? And if you can recognize it, which one it is? And our results is much better than all the baselines. Notably, we compare our work with a baseline that does not learn a policy, but instead directly plan using the learned dynamics model, using sampling-based trajectory optimization techniques. This method requires much more time and achieve substantially poor performance, indicating the importance of this self-supervised policy learning procedure using the learned dynamics model. We also compare our methods with a baseline that use a state-of-the-art physics-based simulation method, which is named the material point method, abbreviated as MPM. We observe that even with extensive system identifications, the identified MPM uh, simulation is still noticeably worse than our dynamics model in terms of the prediction accuracy. And our model only learned from real data turned out to uh, work the best. And so far, what we have talked about is a combined use of particle representation and graph neural network. It is the structure we use to capture the structure and compositionality of the underlying systems. It allows us to model the dynamics, for example, uh, rigid object and their interactions with fluids, as well as the dynamics of deformable objects like class systems and dough. And we are also modeling the interactions between such objects with various of different tools. We have also shown like using the learned dynamics model, we are able to accomplish very, very complicated long horizon uh, manipulation tasks like dumpling making. It involves both the planning at the task level and the motion level, where we are making both discrete decisions like what tool to use and then the continuous decision like condition on the tool, what specific action to take. But however, for all the tasks I have shown until now, what we use is a fixed resolution particle representations of the environments that represents the objects of interest. And next, I would like to argue that fixed resolution representation of the environments may not be the most effective one. And essentially what we want is a dynamic representation of the environments. Here I'm give you a very simple example. Let's assume we want to grab some objects that are far away from you. When the object is far away from you, you only have to know there's an object out there. As you're getting closer and closer to that object, you have to focus more and more on the details and local geometry of that object in order to grasp it. So even for this one single task, we might the most effective representation might need to be dynamic throughout the execution process. Not to tell what if we are handling objects of wide variety of materials, rigid object, deformable object, articulated object, clothes, rope, et cetera. So the, I would like to argue that the most effective representation needs to be dynamic. And for this specific work, we are using object pile manipulation as a test bed to study how we can automatically learn uh, dynamic representations of the environment. As I have shown in the very beginning, object pile manipulation is a common task we typically encounter in our daily life, like in the kitchen environment, or if you are, for example, sorting some like uh, medicine pills. And again, we're representing the object piles using particles. But the question is, given the current observations of the object piles, how many particles do we assign to represent this pile? And for example, we can use more particles or fewer particles, depending on the resolutions we want this perception module to condition on. If we use too few particles, for example, if we just use two to three particles, it is ineffective at modeling the shape of this pile. If we use too many particles, it is inefficient. For example, if we use thousands of particles, imagining the message passing process within the graph neural network, it will take a lot of time to evaluate the effects of a specific input action. So how to choose the number of particles, choose the resolution of the environments becomes the question. And I would like to argue that a good representation needs to be minimal in its capacity, but sufficient for us to do the downstream task. And in order to find the optimal resolutions, we are essentially conditioned on our uh, systems on both the current states 
and the targets. Given the current state and the target, for example, here the target is to uh, gather all the object paths into the regions highlighted on the bottom right. And we want to use this kind of abstraction level or the resolution that is the most effective and maximizing the task rewards or minimizing the task cost. And we are using Bayesian optimizations to do the optimization. Specifically, given the current observations and the target we aim to achieve, and here is the cost of using different numbers of particles, different resolutions to de describe the environment. As you can see, we observe this very nice trade-off. When we use too few particles, it is ineffective at modeling the systems. If you use too many particles under a given time budget, the optimization is inefficient in terms of finding a very good action. And similarly, if we change the target region, for example, it's exactly the same uh, initial observation, but when the target becomes more complicated, you realize the optimal uh, resolution becomes higher. That means the same current states, but more complicated targets might imply the necessity of a higher resolution dynamics model. And on the other way around, for example, uh, given the same states, given, given the same target regions, if the initial state is very spread out and compare with the initial state that is very close to the target, you will realize that when the pile is close to the target, we actually need a higher resolution dynamics model that to review the subtle difference between the pile shape and the targets in order to make progress on, on this task. And when the object pile is very spread out, there's a lot of actions that can make uh, progress uh, in the task. That means uh, we don't need that fine grain of a representation to model the environment. So same targets, different current states also implies different resolution. And then uh, basically given the current observation and the targets, we use Bayesian optimization to obtain the label and we train a resolution regressor to predict the optimal resolution during test time. And conditioned on this uh, resolution, we have a perception module that can generate a set of particles that representing the environment. We can then have a graph neurodynamics model that predicts the evolution of this particle set conditioned on input action sequence. And one thing I hope to highlight here is that we don't have to retrain the dynamics model when we use different resolutions. As long as the node encoder and the edge encoder is conditioned on the resolution, resolution parameter itself, we would be able to uh, allow this model to generalize to systems containing different numbers of particles because that's essentially what graph neural networks do. So we don't need any retraining, just one unified dynamics model will be able to make such kind of future prediction. Then we can define a loss function that measures how close we are in terms of accomplishing these tasks and using gradient descent uh, to back propagate the gradients of the loss function with respect to the action signals to optimize the action sequence. And here is a real world setup we are using to do this object power manipulations. And we are evaluating our systems on object house of a wide range of granularities. The first task we are thinking about is to gather the, uh, the, the, the objects into some target regions. And you can see from the videos, we are handling objects of very different granularities. Some are very, very small like rice. Some have more bulky uh, piles, for example, like the candy and carrots. And the same model without any retraining, without any online adaptations is able to uh, make very effective progress on this gathering task. And um, again, our model is not perfect. So uh, when we deploy this system, we will always have feedback from the environment to correct uh, our model's prediction accuracy, to, uh, pre to correct our model's prediction error and give the model an opportunity to adjust its subsequent action sequence. And we can also ask the model to push this object house to achieve some more complicated target shapes. And you will very quickly realize what the target shapes are in this case. Here we are pushing this object house into a, a, achieving the target shapes of all the English letter shapes, all the way from letter A to letter Z. I would like to argue that nobody else have shown result like this. And it is actually non-trivial in a sense that it involves some non-trivial redistribution 
of the object pieces. Some, how much uh, pieces should go onto the top, some, how much pieces should go onto the bottom. And after you do this kind of redistribution, you have to align these fine details to make sure uh, it actually aligns with the target shapes we desire. And besides uh, these English letters, we have also tried, for example, Chinese characters. This translates to hello world, as well as Japanese characters. This is konnichiwa, which is also translates to hello. So we can achieve these target shapes with very good accuracy. So uh, to summary, um, in the talk I talked until now, we have discussed the combination of particle representation and graph neurodynamics model. Although the dynamics of objects that are compositional and always high degrees of freedom, we have shown very effective use of such models for very complicated tasks like manipulating forms, manipulating object paths, and even uh, make a dumpling out of our using our neurodynamics model. And it comes with two major benefits. The first one is generalization where our system can naturally generalize to systems that are larger than during training. As I've shown earlier in the talk, where if, even if there's more fluid particles, our system is able to handle that. Our system can also achieve unseen target shapes. For example, the data we use to train our object power manipulation model and the dumpling making models are just random interactions of the robots with the environment. But because these structures in our systems, we can achieve this regularly distributed object uh, piles like the letter shapes during testing. The other major benefits is sample efficiency. We're just 20 minutes of real world offline, inter offline random interactions of the robots uh, like interacting with the dove. We'll be able to learn a very good dynamics model that is even more accurate than state-of-the-art physics-based model. And we have, I have also discussed how we can use Bayesian optimizations to dynamically select the optimal resolution to strike the best, the optimal trade-off between efficiency and effectiveness. And start from my very early work on using particle dynamics, this thread of work also inspires two major threads of follow-up work. The first thread of follow-up work uh, is using graph structure neural dynamics to model the dynamics of large-scale compositional systems. Here are some works I particularly like from DeepMind, Intel, and Stanford on the modeling of large-scale particle systems, intuitive physics, and mesh-based systems. Another thread of follow-up is to use particles as a representation for deformable object manipulation. Here I'm showing some particularly interesting work on the manipulation of amorphous materials, clothes, elastic materials, as well as a benchmark from CMU on deformable object manipulation. And finally, I would like to thank all my collaborators on this project I have shown. Without them, it would be impossible to do all the work I've shown here. So yeah, I'm showing just showing the summary slides and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for the question. The question was, uh, although the results look reasonable, but if we compare with how humans can do the tasks, they still like uh, the performance still not as good as humans. And I agree with you, uh, especially in the dumpling making projects, uh, for example, in terms of uh, making a dumplings out of a dough. And we have observed in this task, like for example, uh, the still the modeling of the model of the objects are not particularly precise. In a sense that we are constrained by all the components throughout our entire system. For example, the perception module. We humans can observe the dough from multiple angles, close and going further. We can have a very precise understanding of the geometry. But if we use four RGBD cameras on the, on the, on the surroundings, we are using D415. So the reconstructed shape is not as good as how human can perceive the, the shape, can perceive the shape. So that perception gap, I think, is one important uh, gap. And second one is how we can synthesize the actions. In a sense that we human have this intuitive model in our minds. We can predict the environments, but our intuitive model are not 
100% accurate. For some, through some object forwards, or if you are driving in the, in the streets, we are, making, we are constantly making predictions, but those predictions are not 100% correct. And I would like to argue that our nerd model um, is somewhat comparable, if not better, than our human's imaginations of how the dove is gonna deform. But what's the key gap is this planning ability. For example, given the current observation, how can, how can you do very quick uh, replanning of the actions. And also we humans can come up with very creative use of those tools. Here we constrain our action space, for example, um, the, the parameterization of different kinds of tools, but we humans can use the tool in more, much more creative ways in a sense that uh, we can correct some minor um, deviations from the current observation towards the next sub goal. So I would like to say, in terms of prediction capability, at least in these scenarios, I think human and the model are comparable, but the main gap is on the perception side and the use of the tool side. But on the other task, uh, you have described, for example, the manipulations of object piles. Uh, at the end, we'll be able to, for example, achieve the, uh, the letter shapes. And I would like to say, for example, here, the final results, human would actually be comparable with our robots. And although you can you definitely see some like missing pieces, for example, there's like some outlying pieces here. Uh, I think uh, this is again on the planning side. Our model is able to capture that. That uh, is able to capture that. That's it just like we uh, specified a specific control horizon. Like it goes, if it goes out of that control horizon, we stops. So uh, some, better and care, more careful design of this uh, feedback control loop could definitely make the performance better. And another thing I would like to argue is uh, that humans are better than our agents is again on the planning side. Here we are using a combination of sampling and gradient descent to optimize the action sequence, which is effective. But if you look the video, you actually see some actions, some wasteful actions that are just pushing nowhere or pushing the piles in a way that human obviously can recognize is not optimal. So if humans can come up with a set of actions that can uh, arrive at these targets much faster than our robots can do. So in that sense, uh, a better optimization tools, I think is in needs to come up with a, a better sequence of actions. And we actually have works on that directions. We have a new submissions. They're trying to combine uh, powerful tools from the control and optimization community, use it together with the nerd neurodynamics models to uh, give better guarantees on the robustness and optimality of the derived control signals. Yeah, but that is uh, some ongoing work. Uh, sorry, it's a long answer. Are there any questions from you? Thanks, everyone. Okay, we'll move on to the next segment of, uh, of this workshop, which is the first set of lightning talks. Um, so these are, the, these are the full accepted papers. Uh, the first talk that we'll be here is from Polytechnic Montreal. It's a unified model for continuous con conditional video prediction. Uh, come on. We actually have the slides here ready, so yeah. we can actually, we can try to use those. Yeah. Uh, just Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And today I'm going to share our recent work, uh, a unified model for continuous conditional video prediction. So first of all, what is conditional video prediction? Uh, it's quite simple that basically given a video, we can take... Oh, sorry. 
Oh, sorry. We're sharing the wrong screen. Not good. Yeah. All right. Okay. So basically, uh, what is conditional video prediction? That given a video clip, we can take any frames at the input and we can train a model to predict the missing frames. For example, if we like take the future frames, like uh, at the, the missing frames, and then this task is with your future prediction. And also we got like frame interpolation or past frame correlation. So basically the previous work, they solve different tasks by different models. So our first uh, motivation is to uh, build a model uh, which, uh, which is able to solve different tasks uh, at once. So this is efficient. And also we, it's well known that multiple task learning is beneficial for the uh, performance. And besides, we know that videos are just some discrete samples of this continuous world. So we want to uh, recover that kind of continuous nature. And in this case, we want to build a model which is able to do continuous video prediction. In other words, we can predict the missing frames with the arbitrary uh, frame rate. So in short, his, here is the, the goal of our uh, work that is to build a model which is able to predict any missing frames with the arbitrary frame rate. And uh, before like I talk about our methods, I need to quickly uh, introduce two techniques introduced in our paper. The first one is conditional neural process, which is also called MP. Basically, MP is a type of model which we uh, aggregate some paired observations into some uh, representation R, and then we take a, a predictor to predict the target labels conditioning on that uh, representation. And one important feature for this neural uh, process in that it's permutation invariant, and which means it's perfect for us to unify our uh, different tasks in uh, under this framework. So, and another uh, technique is implicit neural representation. Basically, it's a model which learns some uh, continued mapping from input coordinates to the target signals, and we can uh, implement the INR by several networks or uh, for feature networks. So here is our proposed MPWP model, and it's, uh, it consists of two uh, parts. And the first one is a CN autoencoder, and the second one is the MP-based predictor. Basically, given some context frame we see, we first use a CN to extract the view features YC. And then at the same time, we use a Fourier feature network to learn the embeddings for the context and the target spatial temporal coordinates. Uh, here is XC and XT, and uh, given these three parts, we use a MP-based predictor to uh, generate the features for the target frames, which is a Y hat T, and finally we can reconstruct the pixels by another uh, CN decoder. So here is the detailed architecture of this uh, MP-based predictor, and we implemented this as the a transformer with the uh, encoder and decoder architecture. And given YC and XC, we use a transformer encoder to extract some representation MC. And then we take a transformer decoder, like to, re to get the uh, feature for the target frames, which is Y hat T. And here we use a special transformer uh, block, which is called with HR former block. It's from our private paper, which is used to uh, do some efficient uh, video feature learning. Um, in the vanilla uh, neural process model, we need to both learn the main and variants of this Y hat T, but in practice, we find that first of all, it's really expensive to learn that uh, variance. And secondly, that variance doesn't really capture the stochasticity of that motion. So we just ignore that. And in order to take account for that stochasticity, we, like, we use VAE and we introduce the a uh, latent variable, which is called event latent variable ZE. So based on the assumption that, uh, you know, the context frames and the uh, target frames, they should be generated from the same space. So here we use uh, two branch and to encode the two space uh, separately. And then we use KL divergence to minimize the distance of this two uh, space. And then during test, we will sample ZE from that context event uh, space. 
So here is the R generate two process and also the uh, final loss function. So firstly, we perform some uh, experiments on a task, uh, on a specific uh, VFP task. And here we can find that OKR model, which the SOTA on both KGH and K and KT data sets and for the cityscapes, we also got the best SSIM uh, score. And uh, here we show some like uh, quality examples for the VFP task uh, on KT and the cityscapes. And for the cityscapes, we can observe that our model doesn't suffer from this brightness changing problem uh, from a previous work, which is called uh, MCVD. It's a diffusion based model. And here are some uh, videos for our VFP. Okay, so for the video frame interpolation, we also outperform uh, the previous work with a really large margin. And uh, here we will show some uh, examples over the SM list and video and the KTH data set. Okay, so in order to train a model which is able to like solve multiple ta tasks at the same time, we actually need to input like some random context into that model. And in the figure five, we can we plot some metric metric curves with respect to different context frames. And also we like we plot the performance of the task specific task specific model at the triangles. And here we can show that okay, this unified model has better from performance than the task specific model, and it validates our motivation that uh, this kind of multiple task learning is beneficial. And uh, in the figure four, we show some continuous um, prediction example. For example, in the data set there, we don't get access to the data like at uh, time coordinate 4.25 or 4.5, but actually during test, we can, our model is able to generalize and predict those frames. And at the bottom of that line, we show some difference image between the adjacent frame to show that, okay, they are really actual like different. So here are some uh, video examples for this unified model. So in conclusion, we propose the first neural process model for continuous video prediction, which uh, is able to tackle uh, multiple tasks with one model. And our work is the first that successfully adapts implicit neural representation for a temporal continuous VFP. And the way also, our model is also is able to generate to video with uh, arbitrary high frame rate and uh, our model reaches the SOTA for VFP and VFI on multiple data sets. And that's all, thank you very much. Any questions? Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so there are some kind of standard experiment protocol. For example, for KTH, we for this VF, VFI, I mean, uh, for VFP, for example, normally we predict 20 future frames. And for KT, we predict like five future frames. And for sure that if you want to predict more frames and the quality will quickly degrade. And that's for sure. Yeah. So yeah, for CD scapes will be like 28. Oh, okay. Is there, um, did you find that there are certain types of motion or certain types of events that are harder to, to predict than others, or did you do that evaluation? Uh, in this paper, actually, we do not really do that kind of uh, ablation study, but uh, for sure, that one observation that if there are much kind of stochasticity in this video, for example, for the bare data set, which we got some random robot arms, and for this kind of model, it's a little bit hard, like difficult to model that one because uh, we got some problem for this, like uh, this way architecture is not expressive enough. So, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah.
Okay, our our second uh, paper in this in this uh, session, this part of the session is from Sapienza University of Rome. Um, best practices for two D pose forecasting. Was clear. Nope. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Luca, and on behalf of the team, I'm going to present our work called Best Practices for Two Body Post Forecasting. So the task is essentially forecasting given the past motion, we would like to predict the future one. We concentrated on a scenario involving two agents and uh, the interactions that they have are uh, very extreme and, and different. And our goal is essentially to stock the progress that has been made in single body post forecasting and uh, in a non-trivial way, apply it to a two body scenario. For this task, uh, we use the XPy dataset. We picked this dataset since it's a highly interactive one and uh, it has two agents performing uh, dance. Uh, essentially they're dancing uh, and the dance is pretty extreme. So the actions that they do are not uh, so uh, trivial. The representation is uh, 3D uh, coordinates and um, and as I said, the uh, methodology we used is taken from single body post forecasting. We've tried uh, different combinations and throughout the presentation from now on, I will we will use a tick to um, a check mark to um, represent the methodology that we will use and that we did use and the cross for the ones that we did not. So first off, frequency encoding. Uh, it's a pretty common uh, encoding uh, technique. It uses uh, a discrete Kazan transform uh, function, and it takes as input the body movement and uh, represents it as uh, frequency. And this is one of the practices we, we keep. I'll, I'll later show the results that we have. Second off, the methodology that we then tried is hierarchies. And in summary, it's a way to aggregate neighborhood nodes. And uh, in this case, we did not end up using this technique since in a two body uh, scenario, the aggregation of nodes uh, could actually uh, decrease performance since uh, it's the actions that they're doing are highly interactive and the aggregation of nodes are uh, done uh, stochastically. The encoder technique we use is based on graphs. So as I said at the beginning, the representations, uh, the, the representation are 3D coordinates. So they can be seen as nodes uh, and the connections are edges. In this case, we, um, uh, we use a slight different version of it. It's the separable graph convolution network. Uh, where the spatial and temporal adjacency matrix is factorized, and both are uh, fully learned. So I've been talking about interaction a lot, and the first thing that comes into mind is uh, obviously attention. And we tried that uh, as well, since the previous state of the art did. And uh, as you guys can see, this methodology did not stick um, and gave, gave close to none uh, increase in performance, um, but compromising the uh, computation cost. Lastly, we use an MLP decoder to uh, perform the prediction task instead of a classical temporal convolution layer that it's usually used. 
So, uh, as I said, I'll just go back for a second. Uh, the spatial and temporal adjacency matrix are fully learned and we need to initialize them. Since um, usual techniques, well, usual networks that um, use graph convolution networks are pretty shallow. Uh, this problem has never uh, arose, but in our case, uh, we used a, a more, uh, a deeper uh, network. And we had some unstable uh, training and due to this, we, propose, we also propose a novel initialization uh, to prevent uh, vanishing or exploding gradients. Uh, in summary, the spatial and temporal matrices are initialized, initialized according to a uniform distribution uh, whose uh, bounds are defined considering the number of graph nodes V and the number of time frames T. And uh, we assume the, parameter, the parameters of the matrices to be independent, identically distributed, and have non-zero mean, have zero mean, sorry. Um, this is the formula. You guys can find a, a, deeper, uh, uh, a, a deeper analysis also uh, by using various plots uh, to plot the variance. And as I said, it prevents uh, the instability of the training. And you guys can also see that in our supplementary material. Um, okay, so let's go into the uh, results. The metric that we use is uh, the usual that it's used in post forecasting and uh, it's mean per joint position error. You guys can see it as a uh, L2 loss between the ground truth and the prediction at a specific time frame T. Okay. So um, the highlighted results in red are the uh, previous state of the art. And uh, as I mentioned, the model is uh, attention-based. Um, and the yellow highlighted results are instead our most basic baseline. So only considering the um, graph convolution network. And as you can see, the results are on par on the short term and on the longer term, they're better. So the numbers you see uh, underneath MPJP are uh, milliseconds. So it's uh, 0 0.2 seconds up to one second prediction. So let's start adding our practices. Uh, first off, the initialization. Uh, and it's, uh, it gives us a twofold advantage, one being the stability, the second one being the increase in performance. Then the input representation. So we transform our body motion into frequencies. And uh, apparently it gives uh, also good results, especially in the short term. MLP, uh, and the MLP at the end instead for the prediction gives a better performance on the longer term. So, Combining all of these te techniques together uh, give a substantial increase in performance among all uh, frames with a fraction of the parameters. Um, you guys can see it on the outer uh, right column. So qualitative results, I think being a PDF, there's no animation, but uh, I'll, what we linked our uh, project uh, repo at the end of the slide, so you guys can see it. So just take me on, on my word for it. Uh, it's, it gives better qualitative results, especially this last uh, uh, action uh, showed a very extreme motion and it's essentially like a somersault, a backward somersault. And our model can capture really, really, really good the uh, interaction and aspect of it. So as I said, uh, these are the links for our uh, project repo and uh, paper. And if you guys uh, want to chat more, just feel free to ask also offline. Thanks. Are there any nice questions? Yes. Do you think you can obtain the same result on an image of an eye or a plastic wall that is an image of an eye? 
Okay, so by scenarios, you mean like, oh. okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, um, okay, you know, so the question was, uh, we've trained our uh, model on uh, uh, short clips. And would it work on longer scenarios or different scenarios? Yes, yes. Uh, um, so um, the answer is I'm not sure, but it's it's not a problem probably of our model. Um, but the whole post forecasting uh, research, let's say, because m most of the research is focused on predicting from 0 0.2 seconds to one second. And uh, lately, uh, some papers have tried to push the boundaries, to, so trying to predict longer sequences, uh, also in scenes. So lately, uh, it's not prediction anymore, it's more generation of motion in scenes, but uh, at least the papers that I've read are, they're mostly based on uh, reinforcement learning, so re rewards, trying to, creating unbound motion. So I'm not sure uh, whether it would work or, or not. I think it, it will need some some tweaks probably, especially for the longer term. Thanks for the question. No, 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 we train, um, so we take an input, uh, uh, I guess it was uh, 15 frames and we um, output 25, considering the sampling rate. So answering your question, we take a whole uh, set of frame. We, we just, we don't take only one, but, but more, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we did, but I think it, it, it the idea was already proposed um, by another paper. I think it's called text to motion generation. It's more on the generation side of it, but it uses this autoregressive technique to predict one frame at a time. And it also uses the tokens, as you mentioned. Okay, if you have more questions, I'm free offline for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. But there's no, there's no consent. There's no presenter. No, I, so I, I believe the third paper is from a collaboration between Georgia Tech, MIT, Stanford University, uh, Illinois at Urbana Champaign, and Carnegie Mellon. It's called 3D Infis Towards More Generalized 3D Grounded Visual Intuitive Physics Under Challenging Scenes. You heard from um, one of the authors uh, earlier today as our first invited speaker, but he had to go to a different talk. I don't think we have a speaker for this one right now. Uh, so we're, we're gonna play the, the video. And um, you know, I, you, you, we probably will not be able to take questions on this either. So you would have to reach out to the, to the authors for, for questions. Also, call this intuitive physics, 
which is a critical event that allows us to make the effective plans in a manipulated form to achieve desired outcomes without relying on defensive try and error. As a human, we can learn from the amount of video features from everyday life, which may contain complex elements such as fully output elements and random materials. And then we form an intuitive understanding of the three elements in the video scene. And we can then even generalize it to the instance of city space with objects of different shapes. There are three branches of work on learning to do this. The first branch tries to learn to predict the object motions from pixel images using frame sensitive features. They can generate blur predictions of the 2D video frame. But it is actually hard to apply these methods to 3D space since they are highly user friendly. The features will gradually change and change their viewpoints. Another branch of the work can learn explicit reading video physics using particle based representations. Most works require access to full 3D space of the fine parts during the rendering assembly. However, such information is usually not accessible in real world settings. Finally, recent work like Nerf UI proposes to learn really various new features in 3D space with the help of the neural reading tool. However, they only use the global feature vector in Polytree, which makes it harder to generalize the same to the different frames. Here, we propose our framework, 3D Intuitive Physics, which can learn 3D intuitive physics of complex dynamics and different frames. Our method is composed of a traditional neural reading tool that are visual front end and 3D point based scattering prediction back end. For the visual front end, we train neural to understand our input images with only a subset of the features using which we can construct the explicit figure of the features of the whole data set. To get output centric point clouds, we use color based segmentation mm -hmm. and combine these by central set. Then we train a graph neural network based dynamic prediction type to learn the 3D intuitive physics. Since we don't have the correspondence of the point clouds between different frames in the video, we use center clouds to train the back end. From the pipeline, we can see that both visual ad and dynamic ad impose strong relational and structural inductive bias to capture the structure of the underlying findings, which dramatically increase the generalization ability. Here, we generate three non trivial data sets equipped with secret sets, include, including a water cooling fully, fully filtration and fan cushion. Each of them actually reflect a common interaction with a complex dynamics in the real world. For each of the three environments, we have six different camera views and five different settings uh, by changing the shape of the camera and the amount of the object in the scene. Using which we can test the generalization ability of our method. To show that with the same training setting, our visual front end shows better results than the baseline studio learning methods like Nerf UI and Open Pulley, but both in the different training category settings in the three environments. We also show that our learning dynamics model can do no horizon feature prediction. Outperforming the baseline 3D based method that we buy does not use the explicit superior trivial representation. In both data sets and discovery sets, we use really dynamics features. Also, we show some quality results such as dynamic learn and enhancing scenarios with 3D video features with fully visual objects and random materials. You can see that our method can learn more readable. Okay, that's all for the presentation. Thanks for listening. And here is a quick one. More information can be found by scanning the QR code here. Thanks to Harshan for presentation. It's really interesting to see a little bit more details about the um, about the presentation the professor gave earlier today. So please do check it out if you want to find find out more. Um, okay. Uh, this completes our lighting talk session number one. I might not be.
Okay. Uh, this completes our uh, session one for Lightning Talks. Thanks a lot for to the presenters. Uh, and uh, we're moving ahead. We are going to the second invited talk by Varun Ramakrishna. And by way of introduction, Varun is a senior director of perception at Aurora Innovation. He received a PhD degree from Carnegie Mellon in 2015, advised by Professor Takeo Kanade and Professor Yasser Sheikh. Uh, he worked on perception and mapping at Uber ATG before joining the founding team at Aurora. He also spent time at Microsoft Research and Disney Research. His research and technical interests are in the areas of building production level machine learning and computer vision systems that operate in the real world. Thanks a lot, Varun. Thanks, Nanya.
All right. Yeah, so today we are uh, hauling loads for uh, some of these customers, FedEx, Werner, Schneider, uh, and Uber Freight. Um, and uh, yeah, and here's a uh, you know video of us uh, <clears throat> uh, of our AV uh, hauling a load from Dallas to Houston. Um, in the short video, you can see us handle uh, surface streets get onto the highway, handle merges, handle uh, lane changes, um, uh, a variety of different kind of challenges that you encounter in, uh, uh, in highway driving. Um, and while our primary focus now is on trucking, we are also developing our stack to be interchangeable between platforms. And here's an example of our perception stack um, in action on uh, our passenger car platform in a busy street in Pittsburgh. Um, so you can see uh, vehicles being tracked in blue there uh, and VRUs, uh, vulnerable road users uh, being tracked in uh, those pink boxes. Uh, this is a busy scene, uh, Shendi Plaza in Pittsburgh for some of you who might be aware. Um, so yeah, just, just to give you a flavor of kind of uh, the kind of problems we were working on. Um, so that, that was a little bit of Aurora, about Aurora. And in today's talk, I wanted to give you an overview of some of the challenges encountered while working on the problem of perception uh, for AVs in general, but uh, long haul trucking uh, in particular. Um, I'll go over some challenges uh, that you encounter on the road and then walk through some lessons learned uh, while making a production uh, ML-based robotic system. Um, so one of the key factors in highway driving is the need to see at long range, um, given that the AV is usually traveling at 65 miles per hour or even faster, um, you need to be able to see far to give the AV enough time to respond. Um, uh, so in, in addition to standard object detection and tracking, there are certain scenarios that present themselves that can be pretty challenging for perception. Um, one of the canonical cases where long range comes into play, long range perception comes into play, is when you have a disabled vehicle on shoulder. When you are driving down the highway, when you see a disabled vehicle on shoulder, kind of move over to a, to a different lane. Um, the AV needs to be able to do this too. So in this case, you can see uh, uh, we are traveling in a lane. Uh, in fact, ahead of the... Uh, when, when it loops back, you'll see um, there is this disabled vehicle on the shoulder. Uh, we detect it at very long range. In fact, that disabled vehicle is kind of slowly backing up. Um, and when we get closer, you'll see that there's debris around it as well, which we are able to detect. Um, so long range perception assists in being able to detect that object and give the, uh, the motion planning system of the AV enough time to know how to make a lane change. Um, another uh, common occurrence on long, long haul highway driving is construction. Um, construction is very unstructured. It happens, uh, uh, you know, uh, at different times, uh, and it uh, affects driving by blocking off lanes or uh, changing the way that the AV needs to behave in, uh, around it. So these are all things that the AV needs to uh, reason about, and also is a perception challenge. So here's another example where. Uh, there are some uh, workers uh, uh, fixing something on uh, the electric poles and uh, the AV needs to detect that there was the lane blocked, understand that there is a uh, construction event here, detect all of those things and reason about it. Uh, another perception challenge uh, where long range comes into play is uh, being able to detect road debris. Um, uh, so th this is uh, these are small objects that are on the road uh, that, uh, that you need to avoid and you don't want to drive over. Um, uh, so these are objects that are like 30 centimeters tall. Um, so being able to detect this is, uh, is pretty challenging. Um, CDL drivers, drivers who are driving these trucks don't like to drive over them because they can cut brake lines. Um, so another example of this. just to see another example of this. Um, so here's an example of us detecting this object at range, and then the uh, truck is nudging to avoid that. 
Um, other stuff that you see on the highway, uh, authority vehicles that you need to, uh, that are different from uh, ordinary uh, uh, vehicles, you need to be able to understand that they are an authority vehicle, understand the situation that, uh, that is occurring. For instance, you, you see accident scenes, uh, you see being chased by uh, or being pulled over by a uh, authority vehicle. So being able to reason about these things also are perception challenges. Um, I think there's also a misconception that highway driving is easy because you don't need to worry about pedestrians uh, and other vulnerable road users. But in reality, you see people on the highway uh, quite often and vulnerable use road users uh, pretty often. So here's an example where uh, you have someone very uh, at pretty close range getting into the ego lane. Um, and also it, it very often happens that the situations in which you see vulnerable road users are, uh, are themselves special in some way. For instance, on the right where uh, this uh, vehicle is broken down and uh, there's someone trying to, uh, uh, trying to get, out, get out of the vehicle there. Um, some other challenges uh, are that to have a real product and to operate under uh, uh, all domains, uh, you need to deal with uh, challenging weather conditions. So in, in these cases, uh, you see that um, you're driving on the highway, there's heavy rain, heavy fog. So the perception system needs to be able to uh, both handle these conditions, identify these conditions, and also report on the state of its own abilities uh, when, when we are driving in these conditions. So uh, this, this, this is part of our system that uh, both detects the type of weather. So it's saying whether it's clear or not clear. Uh, it's uh, talking about its own visibility range uh, and is also talking about the state of the sensors. Um, more examples of different types of weather conditions that you need to deal with, um, you know, uh, passing vehicles with uh, smoke that could file your, uh, foul your sensors, uh, bug splatters that could, uh, you know, uh, follow your cameras. So these are real practical challenges of deploying a system. And then if you're driving in Texas, uh, anything that can be hauled will be hauled. Uh, for, for, for instance, on the right there, that's a, uh, you know, a wind turbine, a blade of a wind turbine that's maybe three 18 wheelers long. Um, and you would think that's a rare occurrence, but we've seen plenty of those in our, uh, in our operation. Um, other things like uh, boats being hauled, uh, uh, vehicles being hauled on vehicles, uh, mobile homes being hauled. Uh, we've pretty much seen anything uh, that can be hauled, uh, be hauled. Um, so uh, I did wanna talk about in this next section, uh, what it takes to build a production perception system to handle these challenges. Um, and I'd like to give, a, give you a flavor of um, how we think about these problems. Um, and I think the gist of it is that it comes down to the basics of doing computer vision and machine learning. Um, uh, and uh, some of the basics are thinking hard about your inputs, the inputs to a perception system are sensor data, uh, thinking hard about your data and tooling, thinking hard about your design and interfaces, and thinking hard about your uh, metrics and loss functions. Um, and uh, what we found is that while building a production system that trains on millions of examples uh, and needs to be retrained uh, every so often, um, every single uh, design decision, uh, compromise, flaw that you, that you introduce has compounding effects. So it's really important to go back to the basis, basics and think about each piece. Um, so uh, the first thing I did wanna talk about is uh, uh, sensors and calibration. Um, our goal is to deliver uh, self-driving safely and quickly. So we want to make the most use of uh, all the sensors that will help us do that. Um, so our, uh, our AV uh, uses a uh, multimodal sensing system uh, with camera, radar, LIDAR, um, and a proprietary uh, LIDAR that we call first light. Um, uh, multimodal sensing has the advantage of using complementary information from different uh, sensors. Um, LiDAR obviously does not require uh, ambient illumination. Uh, camera can give you high res at long range uh, and radar can be uh, robust to different types of weather conditions. Um, so uh, we believe, we strongly believe that having complementary sensors uh, lets us uh, ship faster. 
Um, one of the key parts of being able to do long range perception is uh, for us is the uh, is our proprietary uh, LIDAR system, which is a FMCW LIDAR. Uh, some of the advantages of uh, FMCW LIDAR is that uh, unlike standard LIDAR, um, which uh, is based on time of flight, where you emit a pulse and then you detect, uh, look for that same pulse. Uh, here in FMCW LIDAR, we code a signal in the frequency uh, and we can listen for that signal. Um, so this makes it uh, less immune to solar loading, so ambient illumination from the sun, and uh, less prone to interference from other, other LiDAR. So when you have a world where there are a lot of self-driving trucks, you don't want to have interference. Um, so taking a look at an example here of the difference that uh, this lets us have is, uh, we, we've just come around a bend um, and over 450 meters away there's construction. And which with first light LiDAR on the right, uh, we can see that there's a vehicle on the shoulder ahead. Um, uh, and then we can count after uh, the video unpauses, uh, how long it takes for us to pick up the same thing with uh, traditional LiDAR. And basically the, the first LiDAR we get on this, on the construction vehicle, from standard LiDAR is like nine seconds later. So this gives us a big advantage in terms of uh, how much extra time we have to detect that object. And uh, in terms of actually looking at what the detection looks like, um, uh, yeah, we got that uh, detection at the LiDAR points on that object at around 465 meters. Um, and we are able to detect that construction object around, around 400 meters. And the Aurora driver is able to do a lane change much, much earlier than uh, than if we were relying purely on standard LiDAR. Um, the other advantage with FMCW LiDAR is that uh, the, uh, it, it can be miniaturized and uh, we, we, we can use something called silicon photonics to actually put a lot of the LiDAR components on a chip. Um, but having good sensors without good calibration is like a carpenter who doesn't sharpen his tools. Um, and thinking of basics, calibrations, calibration is one of our one of the basic parts of doing uh, perception and doing good sensor fusion. Um, so we take spend a lot of time on getting calibration right, both with factory rigs for calibration, um, uh, field rigs for calibration, and doing calibration in simulation. So we have a synthetic rig there that we can uh, drive the virtual truck around and make sure that our calibration algorithms uh, are validated. Uh, but to do long range perception, even small miscalibrations uh, that can come from various sources, thermal issues, my mechanical vibrations can, can, affect, uh, can affect perception. So to do effective sensor fusion, uh, even uh, you need to even reason about uh, small miscalibrations. So, uh, for, for, for instance, a one milliradian miscalibration between your uh, sensors is half a meter uh, at, at 500 meters, right? So, so your point won't, won't line up with a pedestrian in your image, for instance. Um, so to get around this, uh, we uh, think about how we can make our networks calibration aware uh, and to predict their own estimate of uh, calibration error as well as their own estimates of their uncertainty around, around that calibration error. So uh, uh, on the right, you can see our, uh, the, the model predicting its, uh, its estimate of the pitch offset. And you can see as it does the turn uh, and there are not many features, uh, the model uncertainty spikes uh, and then goes back to, uh, to, its, uh, to a more baseline level. Uh, and then we, uh, we also train the model with these calibration errors infused synthetically. So uh, that this results in a system that uh, is more accurate, can also tell you how miscalibrated you are, 
um, and uh, give you uh, extended range. So let's take an example of how that works. Uh, the, the results from this um, here with just one or two LIDAR points on a vehicle uh, at more than 450 meters, we can uh, detect that object, uh, that vehicle on shoulder, and we can detect a pedestrian, oops, uh, with just one LIDAR point at 400 meters uh, plus. So um, I'm not aware of many results that detect pedestrians at those ranges, but uh, the combination of the, the proprietary, the FMCW LIDAR technology that we've built in-house and uh, uh, being calibration aware with, with our detection uh, enables us to detect things at very long range. Um, the other thing we think a lot, uh, lot about and spend a lot of time trying to get right is uh, our data and labels. So I think one of the most consistent lessons that we've learned is that uh, data and labels are the most important part of getting uh, the system to work. And teams who don't spend the majority of their time thinking about their data and labels uh, uh, will, will find it hard to succeed. Um, and I, I think this is kind of uh, talked about a lot in, the, in, in industry and in academia. Uh, and a pretty common approach to building a data engine uh, looks something like this. You label some data, you train your model, you evaluate the system, uh, you use the model to find where, uh, you find where you've made mistakes, um, uh, and then you feed that back into uh, labeling and you uh, repeat the cycle. Um, but part of this presumes that your data set is static um, and that your data set and the data set quality doesn't change as much. Um, and to be able to measure multiple lines of accuracy, you really need label quality that is, label quality and tooling that is also very high quality. Um, so it's really important that the losses your model is trying to minimize is not label error. Um, so one thing we've uh, uh, realized is that your data set is not, never static. Uh, you need to continuously in, improve your uh, data set. Um, and uh, uh, there are two more arrows in that data engine, which is going from system evaluation and using perception itself to find errors in your uh, labels and, and vice versa. And building tooling such that you can make that, uh, that system actually work. So here's an example uh, of our visualization uh, and labeling platform. So uh, we use this system to both debug our uh, models and our perception system, but we also use the same system to fix our labels. So we found that, that this is really key, that the tooling you build to uh, visualize your system should also be the tooling you build to fix your, fix your data. Um, so if, if you see this, uh, you can see that we are looking at our perception output. We can switch to what the labels look like. And then in the right panel, uh, our tooling shows a particular label and we find that it's you know, slightly off. We can fix it. The right panel shows objects and their representation in what we call track frame. So uh, a kind of motion blur uh, adjusted uh, frame. Um, and building this tooling is kind of really hard. You need people who have a very multi multidisciplinary background. Uh, knowledge of like front-end tooling, back-end, sensors, robotics, computer vision, HCI. Um, it's, it's hard, but fun. Um, and then another key learning is that your pace of improvement and innovation is determined by your pace of iteration. So we put in a lot of effort into automation for machine learning um, and being able to push button, retrain all our models. Um, in, in this case, we use something called Kubeflow, uh, which is a workflow system. Um, so uh, we, we have a goal of being able to just push a button, train the entire system, uh, go evaluate it, fix our data and keep going. Um, the next thing we want to think hard about is how our system is designed and uh, what representations we use. Um, so our system basically consists of kind of three deep three key deep learning modules. Uh, one we call sensor to tensor, which is a uh, object detection system, sensor to adjustment, which is a tracking system, uh, a learned tracking system, and uh, something we call the remainder explainer. And some key design criteria that we care about in, our, in the design of our system is that it can always improve with more data. 
um, that it gets the most out of our sensors and that it uh, represents the world and matter that matters to the AV ad adequately. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about each of these uh, uh, quickly. Uh, sensor to tensor is our main detection system. Um, I think that there's, this is kind of well-trodden ground. There's, at this point, there's a lot of literature investigating 3D detection. Um, uh, uh, but maybe the takeaway here is that uh, we think a lot about how do we um, get, uh, get all our sensor data into uh, unified views that uh, make the most and uh, make the most of the, the information in that sensor data and is, and is not uh, lossy. For instance, um, a LiDAR beam is not just telling you that there's a point out at that, uh, at that location. It's also telling you that there was nothing along the way. Um, so how do we use that information is something we think about. Um, uh, again, the, the takeaway is the same thing here that we uh, uh, use sensor data for, uh, and fuse them early uh, in multiple views uh, and then perform object detection. Um, the other part of our system is a learn tracker. Um, there, there are a few ways to do tracking. Um, learning tracking by detection is one way that's pretty popular. We, we take a different approach. Uh, my advisor Takeo used to say, uh, why do you want to learn that which you already know? Um, so our kind of approach is uh, kind of inspired by that. Uh, and the idea is that you don't need to throw away everything you know about the world when you're doing tracking, uh, which tracking by detection kind of does by every frame, try detecting again and then trying to associate two things. Uh, instead, if you know where your track is at a particular time, uh, all you need to do is know where it needs to go uh, in, in that time step. So in, in these examples here, the white box is our track. Uh, the green box is the ground truth. Uh, and the red box is what the model predicted. So all we need to say is that here's your white box. That's the green box. Predict that update. Right? Uh, so it bypasses association, um, all, all of that stuff. Uh, and finally, you need to be able to think about um, all types of matter. Uh, and this is a system that we call Remainder Explainer, which uh, I won't go into too much today, but uh, just to give an example of its output. Um, so here's an example where we are driving along the road. There's a tree fallen uh, on, the, uh, on the ego path. And we need to be able to recognize that. And this is not some object that you will see very often or uh, uh, have lots of labels for in your data set, but you still need to be able to handle this. So uh, the rem remainder explainer part of our system uh, helps us do that. Cool. And then finally, uh, the last lesson, uh, uh, here is to think a lot about your metrics and loss functions. Um, I think uh, in our standard challenges and uh, data sets, uh, we measure things like average precision, uh, which make a lot of underlying assumptions, uh, which actors uh, participate in your metrics, uh, how they're matched against labels. These, these unfortunately get hidden and don't always necessarily correlate with what it takes to convince yourself that your perception system is ready to deploy without a driver. Um, uh, one example of, uh, of what's, uh, why you need to think about your metrics is the notion of uh, what we call ranked actor importance. That is that not all actors that you encounter around the AV are uh, created equal. Um, some getting, uh, getting the correct track on some actors that affect the AV are more important than others. And there's a lot of nuance in what factors matter. Um, obviously, proximity to the actor matters, but there's also things like legal guidelines, um, being uh, reducing risk, um, uh, having behavior that's legible to other actors on the road. So you don't have sudden movements such that uh, you know other actors would behave uh, or would be it would be surprising to other actors on the road. And even things like courtesy, like making a lane change while an actor is merging. So uh, all these are factors that affect what actors actually matter. Um, and some, some of the approaches we've been working on is um, how can we design functions that tell you 
um, how much a particular actor matters and encode expert preference uh, that uh, tells you that. And then finally, um, what makes a good match? Um, uh, when do we know that uh, a prediction actually matches ground truth? So one standard thing that we do in, uh, in some of our challenges are uh, things like IOU, um, but that doesn't really uh, uh, make sense always. So for a vehicle that's traveling right next to you at high speed, you need to get the surface that's closest to you really accurate to centimeter accuracy. Um, versus you don't need centimeter accuracy when that vehicle's at 400 meters, right? So how do you design a metric that encodes that uh, both of those things? Um, and, and also uh, encodes the fact that, uh, for instance, here, I think what the middle example, even if you have perfect IOU, if your velocity prediction for that means that you're predicting that that actor would take a, you know, move off to the left versus going forward, uh, you need to capture that as well. So uh, again, here we take a approach of being able to uh, rank preferences and uh, develop a matching function that gives us a, a score. Um, so uh, I think with that, I just want to conclude with uh, a recap of the lessons from the trenches of working on this problem, uh, which are to think hard about your inputs, think hard about your data and tooling, think hard about your design and interfaces, and to think hard about your uh, loss functions. Um, thanks, and uh, we are hiring. So uh, if uh, you are looking, uh, please visit our careers page. And Uh, we have a question. We have questions from, from um, you said perception to evaluate our labels. Yes. Uh, I meant uh, using perception to evaluate our labels. So knowing where perceptions and your where percept the output of the perception system and your labels disagree gives you a clue as to where you might have a perception error or a label error. So using perception in the loop lets you uh, find label errors. Once you fix them, your perception system gets better and it generalizes more. And then you can use it, use that again to go and go back and find label errors. Isn't that a chicken and egg problem? It, it is a chicken and egg problem. So you need to bootstrap first some way. Uh, and then you need to keep iterating until your it's kind of a race between your label quality and then your perception quality and you, keep, you need to keep keep holding questions yeah chris yeah so um you only have to share what you can share yeah but i think uh, you know, a lot of the things you share here are very specific yeah so this is where i see gdpr in terms of like the latest research that's coming out like areas that that are kind of um, from your perspective, which areas are important? Excuse me, very important or like very like uh, high potential where we can just do more work in this area? Just to see. Yeah, so I think a lot of problems are uh, to, to de deploy the technology at scale. A lot of problems are um, in the long tail and also in the way that, um, in a way that. Uh, the system needs to understand something at the scene level, right? Uh, it, it, it doesn't need geometric primitives. It doesn't need to know that there are boxes. Uh, for example, when you're encountering a, an accident scene, um, you have to think about what the AV sees. The AV might see that there's a bunch of boxes, but it doesn't connect that to this is an accident scene. So um, uh, there, are, uh, there is semantic information at the accident, at the scene level. And um, thinking about how we can uh, predict that and build data sets for that, I think is, is a challenge because I, I think a lot of the um, uh, things in the long tail, you can only reason about at the, I think human drivers reason about at the scene level rather than uh, in terms of, I know where every object in the scene is. Right. So that's, that's one area. Um, and then I think uh, being able to, uh, detect objects without knowing their category 
is going to continue to be, uh, I know there's a lot of work on that, but will continue to be interesting and important. Thanks. Uh, okay, well, we have a lot more questions. So I have a question. Talk about the team level. Yeah. You just asked ChatGPT where, <laughs> where, where to drive. So now we don't have to need that. <laughs> uh, I don't know about ChatGPT, but uh, I think uh, you know uh, foundation models and the link between language and uh, vision are promising directions. Um, yeah, I think there's something there. Uh, I don't know about chat GPTs particularly, right? Um, yeah. Uh, we'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks for yeah, me. thank you. Okay, uh, let's move move ahead. So thanks again to Varun for an interesting talk. Uh, this completes our second invited talk, and we're moving ahead with uh, second session of Lightning Talks. We have three interesting interesting papers here, uh, starting with still fast. Now that we have a presenter. Uh, let me share. Oh, let me just jump to Zoom to make sure that I'm sharing the right. Where's my mouse? I think this is working. Let me just share. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Francesco Ragusa from the University of Catania, and today I'm going to present our work still fast. So the problem that we address is the short-term object interaction anticipation. So given a video V and a timestamp T, methods are required to predict future interaction after a delta time interval. So a prediction consists of a bounding box around the object that will be interacting in the future and a noun which are associated to this next active object, a verb which describes the future interaction a time into contact, which is a real number, which indicates when the future interaction will start, and a score. So previous work addressed this task, especially in uh, the baseline, which has been uh, developed with the eco for the challenge. And in this work, uh, we, we, we can see that uh, the model is composed of two branches, a faster RCNN object detector, which takes an input an high resolution still image, and detects the bounding box around the next active object, and a slow fast action recognition 3D method that given a low resolution video uh, as, uh, associate a verb to each next active object. And this model can be trained in, in two separate stages. Firstly, a faster CNN uh, is trained using all the next active object labels, in a separate stage, as, as low fast network is trained to assign these verbs for each uh, next active object bounding boxes. In this work, we propose a new method that uh, is able to is, uh, is uh, composed of two branches. It is a hand to hand method that can be trained. And uh, so it is able to simultaneously 
uh, simultaneously process uh, two inputs, which is an high resolution image and a low resolution video. Then these inputs are passed to their two backbones, a 2D backbone and a 3D backbone to extract uh, feature stack. Then the 3D feature stack is upsampling to match its dimension to the dimension of the 2D feature stack and then are summed these, these features. Then with a feature pyramid layer, we, we obtain a combined feature pyramid layer that is sent to our head. Our head is composed of a region proposal network and a royal line layer, which extracts local features from these bounding boxes. Then we aggregate a global feature, which represents the whole scene. And we fed this local global feature to our fusion network. At the end of this fusion network, we summoned again local features with a residual connection. Then through a fully connected layer, we obtain the probability distribution related to nouns, related to verbs, and the time to contact. We perform an experiment on the Ego 4D dataset, and we, uh, we consider the two versions of, the, of this dataset. Version one, which is composed of 120 hours annotated with a taxonomy of uh, 87 nouns and 74 verbs. And the version two, which is composed of uh, 243 hours and uh, annotated with a taxonomy on 128 nouns and 81 verbs. We evaluated our method using a top five mean average precision. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, on uh, the performance on the validation set of the version one, we can see that uh, our methods outperform faster RCNN baselines, especially in the verbs related measures. And uh, it obtains a worse performance related to the noun predictions. When we uh, use uh, more training data, this gap is reduced because the version two of the ego for this data set contains more training and validation data and but uh, shares the same test set. Then when uh, we tested in the test set of the version one of ego 4 d we compared our method with faster CNN baselines and also intermediate. And we can see that consider the overall top five mean average precision, we outperformed all the methods. And it's interesting to, to, uh, to know that we outperformed intermediate, which is a, a method composed of more recent components. In this case, for example, intermediate is composed of a, uh, of a, video, a video mask with encoders and a dino object detector, respect still fast, which is composed of a faster CNN and, uh, uh, and the X3D, uh, X3D model. Then when we test, uh, in the, when we use more training data, we can see that our method outperform all, all, all the other, all the, all other methods. So these are some qualitative results in which we can see with the red bounding boxes that go through annotations and in green, we can observe prediction of our still fast, which are composed of noun, verb, time to contact and the bounding box around the next active objects. And these are a qualitative result in, in, in which the hour still fast uh, predict wrong, uh, wrongly. Okay, we perform an, also an ablation study to understand the potential of each component of our method. We try different heads, then we, we try different components of our heads, for example, removing global features or removing uh, residual connections. And then we try also different backbones, for example, using only uh, 2D backbones or uh, uh, without using convolutional uh, uh, residual. So our method is ranked first at the, at the Ego 4D Challenge 2022. And for this year is the official baseline. And uh, is, uh, there is a, the, the, this slide show that there is a method, a novel method that outperformed our uh, still fast with a, a very small gap, uh, considering the overall top five mean average precision, which is the last column. Okay, thank you for the attention. Thank you, Francesco. Do we have any questions? Um, hi, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, so, I was a bit doubtful. 
Ya. So, no, in our no, in the here we can see that if we consider only nouns, correct nouns, we have a, a higher performance. But the problem is when we introduce the prediction verbs and then time to contact, the performance goes down. And so I think that in future work, future work have to focus uh, have to focus it on uh, uh, improve the prediction of verbs and time to contact respect to the object. Any other questions? Two questions from the okay. uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we have a uh, next. Uh, next talk, we're continuing with our with our uh, lightning talks. Uh, we have bush detection for vision based UGV guidance. Let me just share. Uh, am I sharing this on Zoom? Koa, are we sharing? Good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dmitry Stefanovic. I'm a researcher at Biosense Institute from University of Serbia, uh, from the University of Novi Sad, Serbia. And uh, I will present your joint work with my Biosense colleagues. Uh, Vladan Filipovic, uh, Nina Pajevic, Jelena Grbovic, Emil Juric, and Marko Panic. Uh, we propose this new data set uh, for bush detection in blueberry orchards, and uh, uh, we uh, present some baseline uh, results. Uh, bush detection problem occurs uh, within uh, Plexig Robots uh, uh, Horizon 2020 uh, project, funded by European uh, Commission, and uh, in our pilot, uh, we developed uh, EOGV uh, that is, uh, uh, which uh, has, uh, which, where uh, a role, where bush detection has a role, uh, key role in uh, its guidance system. Uh, basically, in this uh, project, uh, the main goal is to uh, use uh, unmanned ground and uh, aerial vehicles in agriculture. And uh, as I said, we developed uh, one of these uh, UGV systems. Um, uh, as, well, as far as we know, uh, there are no uh, data sets that could provide the solution for this uh, bush detection. And uh, the, in the most cases where there is uh, uh, some kind of tree de detection, authors are focusing on uh, detecting trunks, but there is no bush-like uh, uh, example such as uh, blueberries. Uh, Therefore, we uh, present this new uh, data set, uh, which we acquired in a place called Bab in Serbia. And uh, we uh, used our robot platform Gari, which uh, is equipped with OG camera. Uh, and we used it to capture uh, 2000 RGB images. Uh, the data set is publicly available and it, uh, on Zenodo uh, with all the annotations. Uh, as uh, the images uh, were captured from the UG perspective and uh, at the height of 0 0.5 uh, meters. And uh, the camera is uh, mostly directed towards the, the plant from the center of the blueberry row. Uh, but there are also sequences where the uh, uh, camera is rotated down the rows. So basically we have 20 image sequences uh, of variable lengths and uh, uh, we have uh, the, the all the annotations are uh, done uh, in a specific way. We'll see uh, how, and uh, you can see some of the statistics in the pie charts uh, in the upper part of the 
uh, of file and uh, the basically the annotations that were of interest in this case were blueberry bushes and poles. Uh, blueberry bushes, for example, for micropositioning of our UGV in the uh, orchard and the poles were there. Uh, we wanted to distinguish them to prevent uh, some kind of uh, equipment damaging uh, in the operation, such as uh, soil sampling or spraying, or uh, etc. Uh, as of the variability, uh, uh, we tried to uh, make the data set uh, uh, have all those uh, variabilities that we uh, see in the real life uh, data, and uh, uh, there's there's a bunch of those uh, examples uh, from uh, bush shapes to pole types, uh, where we have different types of uh, um, poles. And also uh, we have uh, various levels of shadows, contrast, and uh, also occlusions uh, caused by uh, weed uh, or uh, branches, the leaves, uh, et cetera. Uh, some of the limitations so far uh, data sets uh, are that uh, it is captured only in one orchard and uh, it's uh, done to uh, only to daylight and uh, in the season. So basically there is no uh, images during the night and there is no images um, uh, in the winter conditions. Um, as for the labeling procedure, uh, it was not that uh, simple as for some compact objects such as uh, uh, cars or cats or something like that uh, because of the natu nature of the blueberry bush. But we, uh, for the blueberry bushes, we uh, tried to focus on that uh, part of uh, blueberry bush, which resembles uh, triangular shape and also be its contact with the ground. Uh, for the poles, it was much simpler task because it's a um, uh, simpler object and it can uh, easily be uh, annotated using a bounding box. Uh, yeah, uh, as of the labeling, uh, we use the uh, cell the labeling um, uh, strategy where we uh, train, where we uh, hand uh, pick the initial 400 images uh, to train an initial YOLO V5 uh, uh, model, and then use that model to run it on the remaining 1600 images and uh, to obtain uh, the, the labels. Uh, we uh, firstly split those 400 images into 10 uh, subsets, uh, which are, and each of them was uh, labeled by uh, the different uh, annotator. Uh, and uh, at the end, when we got all uh, 200 images labeled, uh, we uh, checked them, so visually inspected them, uh, corrected them if necessary, and removed them or, or added uh, if there is no uh, detection. Uh, as of the uh, baseline models, we used uh, three uh, complex levels of YOLO E5 uh, uh, model and nano, small, and medium. And uh, we split the data set uh, into uh, uh, based on uh, sequences on uh, training validation and test sets. And, and from for augmentation, we used horizontal flipping, HSV scaling, and the mosaic in augmentation. Uh, result that we got uh, showed that uh, train models achieved uh, promising performance during uh, the evaluation, uh, thus setting a good basis for further work uh, on improving the performances uh, on the task of blueberry bush uh, detection. But uh, it was not the focus of our work to, to generate good results. It was just to uh, manage to create the data set that could uh, uh, solve us the, the problem, but also to generate new uh, research areas to, to solve the problems uh, using this uh, data set. Uh, so the positive results, uh, well, we had a, a generally good uh, detection of occluded bushes. We had a large number of instances uh, detected correctly, but there's also some problems with uh, when we are having uh, ambiguity in annotations and faraway objects, uh, also when the images are rotated. And, uh, but basically we have good generalization uh, abilities uh, for unseen uh, data. Uh, also one of the uh, good sides are that detection speed uh, is suitable for uh, real-time applications. 
In conclusion, uh, we propose new data set for uh, bush detection uh, task uh, and possibly for some other uh, tasks such as uh, bush detection or uh, weed detection or uh, let's say spraying um, area estimation for let's say a task of uh, spraying the weeds. And uh, we had uh, we seen that the, it's possible to use YOLO V5 models uh, for this task. Uh, our future work uh, should include uh, data set improvement. Uh, we should add more images, uh, more uh, dates, uh, different conditions, and uh, also more augmentations, and to try to uh, get some further results analysis on the new data sets. Uh, these are uh, my colleagues that uh, were involved in this uh, study, and uh, if you are interested in informing yourself uh, what uh, in what projects we are participating and what we are doing, uh, here are some of the QR codes that you can scan, and that will be all. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm ready. I had a question. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned that there is a plan to expand the data set and expand the application. So how to what uh, problems would it be applicable? Because the very very specific to the resources. Yeah. Uh, how how actually they are they related? Given the very specific. Yeah, but uh, basically this is done for blueberry orchard, but there's uh, various uh, types of bushes that are, uh, let's say, uh, similar to the blueberries that could be used for that. But uh, also there's, uh, as I said, uh, some tasks that are not uh, uh, that important for the variety that we are having in the orchard. But uh, we also, uh, as I said, we have the problem of weeds that we have to spray it in some optimal way. And uh, it's uh, also something that we can do with this data set or uh, data set that we are currently uh, making as there is uh, also already, I think uh, about four or 5,000 images new, newly uh, imaged. So that's something that we will basically improve this data set with. So. Mm -hmm. ah, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, we are continuing with our with our lightning talks. Uh, we have depots. Do we have a speaker? Yu uh, Yu or Yan Cheng? Doesn't seem that we have actually a speaker screen. Uh, given that we are running a little bit late, we all we will leave this as a uh, as a uh, we'll put a video at our web uh, at our website, so we'll be able to check out the video of this talk. Um, given that we are continuing with uh, with our. All right, let's continue with our third invited talk for today. Uh, it's from Dr. Weishang uh, Shi. Dr. Shi is a professor and chair of the Department of Computer and Information Sciences at the University of Delaware. Uh, he leads the Connected and Autonomous Research uh, Laboratory and is the center director for a recently funded uh, NSF center focused on electric connecting, uh, connected and auto autonomous technology for mobility. And he's an internationally renowned expert in edge computing, autonomous driving and connected health with papers that have been cited more than 6,000 times. Um, he's also a fellow of the IEEE and an HCM distinguished scientist. So uh, we're very lucky to have him, have him give this talk today. Uh, Dr. Shi, can you, uh, are you able to 
hear us and I will stop presenting and you can share your screen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, since I can see you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Unfortunately, we do not have a camera in this room to use. So. Uh, oh, oh, that's fine. But I'm just curious why I cannot share my uh, share my. I probably need to rejoin. I guess. Oh, we can we can see your screen now. Oh, you can see my screen. Yes, yes. So if you if you present, I probably share the whole screen just now. Yeah, well, whatever way is easier. Can you see the whole thing now? <laughs> yes, we can see we can see it fine and we can hear you clearly. So this is this is good. Let me see. This is not the one I want to present today. So this is the one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much for the uh, invite. Since you don't have a camera, I don't know who is talking right now. Uh, Kwa or uh, somebody? Yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, I can see yeah. one of you here. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. This is this is Utsav and Nemanja is here as well, and Kwa's in the in the in the audience. Oh, okay, okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to to be here. Actually, I really want to attend this this year's you know, CBPR from the beginning because I never attended. It. As you can see, that um, my talk will be very different from many of the other, you know, the colleagues uh, talk here because I'm not in this community. Myself is more uh, uh, is more in the computer system, but I just happened recently working on this connected autonomous vehicle. Uh, I think when when you guys invited me to to share with you, um, you know, what what's the vision here? I I think it's a great opportunity because recently, uh, what happened is I had a chance to talk to several colleagues working in the CVPR community. The reason is they want to approach me and ask that some interesting questions about the autonomous vehicle, uh, connected vehicles, and, and, and etc. So I think it's good to share some of the challenges that uh, we are facing. So that uh, you know, some of you probably, if you have a PhD students, uh, you know, here, then I hope after this talk you can find some interesting topic to work on. Okay, so. Here is the uh, roadmap for, for this talk. Um, basically, it's, it has uh, two parts. First one is, I really want to give you a vision about what we recently call it as a vehicle computing. That, or what that is, you know, so, so sort of give you an idea. And then uh, based on our experience in the last uh, six years, I want to share you some challenges uh, that we are facing here. And some of them could be, uh, you know, is an interesting topic for you to work on. Some of them maybe is just some of the um, interesting observation from our community, and then that how that can impact to, to yours is is an open question for you to talk. And then, if I have time, I want to give you a little bit about idea of what our lab is doing, so that uh, along these lines, okay. So, why are we starting talking about uh, something called the vehicle computing? So if you take a look at these slides, you will see that in the last, basically, in the last five years, if you pay, if you pay a little attention to all the OEMs, when I say OEM, uh, it means those, uh, the, you know, the, the, the company who, who sell all these real vehicles, such as uh, Toyota, Ford, GM, Volkswagen, BMW, et cetera. So if you, if this figure show you that in the last five to 10 years, Pretty much all of these OEMs starting team up with one of these cloud providers. The reason is very simple because all the future vehicles are connected. So if all the vehicles are connected, today's OEM, they don't have enough not the workforce or the knowledge to handle them. Because traditionally the vehicle model is they build the vehicle, you go to the dealership, buy a vehicle. Then basically you don't really have too much relationship with the companies but with the connected, with each of the vehicle is connected to them. And then you can imagine they can collect a lot of data. And one of the data could be camera, lighters. Because of this data collection, that gives a huge challenge to these OEMs because they don't know how to handle that. For example, one of the projects working with Toyota uh, is, I mean, each year Toyota sell 10 million vehicles. If you consider that uh, 10 years, that means they have like a, a hundred, you know, 
a uh, hundred million vehicles running on the road. What they're gonna do with this type of data? That will be really a big challenge for them. So that's what the first thing I want to give you a landscape. And the next thing is, some of you might be seeing a vehicle before, an uh, autonomous vehicle before, but this just give you an idea. This is a vehicle, a research platform uh, owned by my lab. So if you're looking for this particular vehicle, it's just a 2017 for the future. But if I tell you, the for the future itself, the price is only one tenth of this whole platform. I usually spending about two hundred thousand dollars on this platform. So that that just give you idea that uh, that you know what a connected autonomous vehicle look like is. Many of you probably familiar with that. You you're gonna do sensing with different kind of uh, you know the sensors. Most of the CVPR community actually is working on the first part and the second part in the perception. Right? You need to understand it where I am, object data recognition, or this, this workshop is called the pre-cognition, pre right? Object tracking, there's a couple, many other things. Uh, uh, in the CVPR, you're gonna see a lot of people, it's published paper related to, to this, but that's not the end of the story. So uh, the first message that I wanna say in today's talk is, why do you do sensing and perception? It's not just for fun. You do this is because you want to build a safe autonomous system. So keep that in mind, because whatever you are doing, eventually, if it's not making the car safe, that is useless, okay? That was something I want to, first thing I want to throw to this community to think about that, because you could have developed a very tricky algorithm, but if you're taking too long, you know, by the time you already make a decision, you know, people already been hit, or the car is already, you know, roll over, over the, uh, you know, over the road, then your algorithm basically is not very helpful. You know, okay, that's, but because the third thing here is, it's really about the decision. You know, once you sense in this environment, eventually you want the car to have enough time to make a decision. Decision is not zero latency. Decision in itself is also gonna take time and, and et cetera. Just to give you an idea about that, you know, we are actually building a real system, you know, physical system. We're not just talking about a pure algorithm running in the memory and the computer. So that was a, a, a thing I want to share with this uh, community. So basically, uh, you don't need to look at the details of, of each of the sensors, but the idea is uh, among this vehicle today, sonar, you're gonna see most of the vehicles are gonna equipment that all the sensors can cover around. So but they have different type of them. Some of them is, uh, you know, uh, it's a shoulder range. Some of them is a long range and depending on the different type of the techniques. So because of the, because of this kind of a vehicle that is connected and autonomous driving is actually gonna change in the landscape is a significant. For example, traditionally, when we talk about the vehicle, we think that the vehicle in the last century is just a transportation tool. But if the vehicle is autonomous, can be autonomous drive, uh, drive self-driving with a connected, you know, collecting all this type of data, then the vehicle gonna be, the usage of the vehicle will change in revolutionary. So that is the key point, the first part of this talk. You know, an era of vehicle computing is coming. You can think about vehicle is a, just a computer running on the wheels. You know, before when you're talking about the computer on the wheels, people don't believe that because there's a human driver sitting there who is the boss making the decision. But imagine if you have a, all this connected autonomous vehicle, without the human driver sitting on it. And this guy, this, this car can drive around and do many of the things. You know, when you go to the work, once you, you, you know, get off the vehicle, then the vehicle can go outside to be a Uber, to be a Lyft, they can make money. Even during right now, right? While you are sitting in a, in a conference room, your vehicle probably is already outside and make some money for you now. And they can also, using the sensors, you know, driving around on the city, they can detect some potholes and this type of things and they can sell these services to the you know, city and then they can probably make some money here there too. So that's, that's why the whole landscape of how the vehicle will be very different than what we used to. So that was another vision we talked about related to the vehicle computing. So here, the key idea here is a vehicle as a mobile sensor. So I think if you're thinking about the vehicle before, the, the second message I want to deliver today is you don't need to focus on autonomous driving itself because driving is just a, one function of the vehicle. But your, your vehicle sonar 
because of the sensors will allow you to do many other things. So I hope next, you know, solar, you're gonna see many of the other papers, people can work on the vehicle as a sensor instead of just a vehicle as a, as a transportation tool, you know, focus on the autonomous driving. Autonomous driving will be just a one part. Sonar is gonna be a very small part of the vehicle. Vehicle can be used to do many things. For example, you know, one of the projects that we are, we are working on is how do you do, you know, for industry plant, the safety patrol, right? And even for, for the police officers, they can do the escort, they, you know, how do the, when the police officer parks the car there, the car can go around and then continuously monitoring the safety of the environment, such as when you hold this marathon, you know, during the Boston marathons uh, activities and etc. So those are the, uh, I list a few things. That's the vision, what, whether we're talking about the vehicle computing. So it's different from traditionally vehicle is the end user as the, there you go to edge server to the cloud. Instead, the vehicle is a computing unit mobile computing unit. They're gonna drive with drones, body cameras, scooters. They can do many things, even you know, industry and health. Uh, for example, you can drive, uh, a vehicle can come into a village into these developing countries. You know, Then this the vehicle can do uh, even physical check. They can do many other things. You know, they can even do the real time when you take a blood, then they can do some computing here. They can do uh, quite a few things. Face recognition, many of the things can be done within a vehicle. Again, uh, the point here is vehicle is not, is not for the transportation. It's for many, many other mobile stations. So once you have this in mind, you will realize that today, when you are talking about you know, this uh, computer vision-based uh, kind of the, the researchers related to the vehicle, you're gonna be open, open the whole mind. Like a previous talk, talking about the push, right? So today, Maybe the push is you, you create a data set. I don't know how the data set was collected, but the sooner you will see, maybe it's already have that. The data set could be generated by a mobile uh, autonomous, autonomous vehicle is on the, on, for the farmers. So they can go through the road and then they can just, they can just uh, see how many bushes are here and, and then which, how, how much you know, the, that kind of uh, water should be putting in the different places and et cetera. So those are the things just, just to create more and more challenges, you know, for the, uh, uh, which enabled by the vehicle. I hope by this time, you probably agree with me that uh, this is a huge, you know, that opportunity. Because traditionally the vehicle utilization is about 10%. Once you have this, open this up, you, the vehicle utilization is 100%, which will be almost, uh, not, you know, an uh, order of magnitude increase of the utilization. There's uh, tons of the new challenges facing here for the algorithms, um, you know, different type of things. So we, we need to all work in together to address this. So this one is to show you that because of the sensors, they're gonna generate a lot of data. This was based on estimation in 2017. As of today, the, the data per vehicle each day, they can generate it is even bigger, you know, 35 terabytes of data, how are you gonna be processed? That's why in you know, another research, I recently uh, had a meeting with West Digital, which is a storage company. Now they are starting to look at the, what are we gonna do with this storage for these vehicles? That's normally people don't even think about the storage as an issue, right? But now it became a challenge. So there's an estimation here is the vehicle generated by, uh, here they call the ICV, because this was coming from East Asia. East Asia like to use an intelligent connected vehicle. The US side, we like to use a CAV, connected autonomous vehicle, but the idea is similar, is how much data gonna be ge generated through this vehicle. 17% of the global data will be coming from the vehicle alone. So there's a thousand of things that we need to do. To give you an idea about what does the future computing system look like on a vehicle? So here is, because the vehicle itself, in order to satisfy this different computing requirement, it's also keeping evolving. Here is a traditional architecture. You have about 150 to 200 ECUs, you know, like a window and a break, like a seat is all controlled by the individual, uh, you know, this kind of uh, control unit. But that is not very efficient. The sonar you're gonna see next generation revolutionary for the vehicle itself is called software defined architecture. You're gonna have a couple of very powerful called domain controller, which you can think about them are supercomputer. One of them may be reserved for the driving autonomous vehicle, you know, for, for the driving purposes. And then the other half most likely will be, will be used for to supporting all kinds of other 30 party services. 
So that was the, the idea that even the computing itself is going to be changing significantly for the future vehicle. So again, then they were talking to the edge, to the cloud, and etc. So I don't need to spend too much time in here. So to give you an idea about what does software-defined vehicle mean here to us. So just to give you a roughly idea that there are future vehicle going to have four type of services. The one obviously is a safety services, the collision avoidance, you know, panel hole, black ice detection. For example, can your algorithm detect that there's a block uh, black ice on the highway? <laughs> that is going to be a very important services. You know, someone is going to pay the money for for application that you can download to run it on your vehicle. So you and I probably have the same vehicle, but it depends on what type of service I want to buy so we can have a very different services. So today, whatever service you purchase from the vehicle, you have a little bit of option when you, when you purchase, but you don't have that flexibility. Sooner, the vehicle will be just like an iPhone today. You and I have the same model, but the applications probably only have 30% of you have a similar. Um, many of the things depend on what you want. So that just gives you an idea that mobility service, information services, and then even some computational services, you can do many things like in vehicle meeting. Some people probably will be provided more cool services on the in vehicle meeting uh, stuff is running on, running on the vehicle, you know, real time uh, Zoom meeting. Like uh, I couldn't give a talk while I'm sitting on the vehicle, you know, this type of things. So that just gives you an idea that what type of service is going to be running there? Uh, I hope. Uh, so by this time, yeah, because I only have, uh, yes. Time-wise is good. So next thing I want to tell, tell, share with you some of the challenges I, you know, we, we are facing and also that I face on my interaction with a few, um, you know, research in the CVPR community that uh, I found that they, they think this is very important. So this is purely based on my, you know, chatting with them. So I think it's good to share, share with you. Uh, if, if you don't buy this idea, yeah. Please, you know, it's nothing here is, uh, is like a scientifically being approved. This is more just based on my chatting with some young uh, junior faculty members in that, in that community, okay? So number one, all of this is a computational latencies here. As I mentioned earlier, all these algorithms you are developing here have is time sensitive. Very important. Make sure that the algorithm have to get a result before we can make a decision. Otherwise, no more they're going to deploy your algorithm, at least at, at, at the current time. So that was the, the first thing. As you can see, that there are I list three different types of real-time, you know, constraints. Some of them is hard, like, like object detection. In people in front of you, you have to detect it before we can take action, right? Some of them probably is a software, like a path planning, trajectory planning. If you get in late, it does the life threatening. It's okay. Some of them is purely long critical, so you can take as long as, as possible. So when you develop any algorithm here for the vehicle, think about which category you are doing, that is important. Uh, for the details here, how do we do that? Um, I can, you know, you can do research, accelerate the inference and et cetera. Um, I can, I will skip this, okay. Second, second challenge is many researchers don't even know, uh, care, think about that. The data transmission is not free. So what does that mean is, when you develop an algorithm or when you come out with something, you need to really think about who is paying for it. Because imagine that, I, I have a little calculation here. If you consider one gigabyte of data, today in the United States, it probably costs about around $10. So if you are doing this, imagine that each single vehicle building in with a SIM code, collecting all this data, sending back. That alone, for, for one year, the, the number of vehicles Toyota make, is going to generate the 20 per petabytes of data, cost a $1 billion for Toyota. So if you go to dig, uh, do a little search, ask, uh, ask the Toyota how much revenue, I mean, uh, the revenue probably is big, but what's the profit in there? Who are going to pay for this $1 billion for the, for, the trans, for the transmission cost? If this is going to be by the OEM, by the company, then I don't think they are ready to do that. If we push all this to the customers, I don't think you are willing to pay this either because you don't want to do that. That's why another research here is your algorithm, you need to consider that what is the, the data, the bandwidth requirement generated by your algorithm to why you want to deploy on a vehicle. For example, I make a simple naive example here. If your data 
if your algorithm needed to downloading several you know megabyte of, of data for every single running between this uh, your vehicle all the way to the back end then most likely nobody's going to deploy your algorithm because who going to pay for this okay that's that's the second challenge i think is kind of interesting for you to consider and then i talking a little bit about the, one of the observations so challenge three is interesting things on the algorithm side it's like uh, you might come out the algorithm think that okay i can do the object detection with this accuracy with this time but in the reality is variations so this is the work done by one of my PhD students published in the real time system last december we found out that you can see this box is there are quite a few variations which means the same algorithm same hardware but the input is different you're going to see a very different result this is another thing is we're going to evaluate your variation of your algorithm because if your algorithm uh, you know we found out that not all algorithms have the same kind of variability so if we found that your algorithm have a pretty wide range of, of the variability then we probably will not deploy your algorithm either because that is very dangerous because you we can't really guarantee anything here so here is a potential variabilities you have the the depend on the read the io if your algorithm read a lot of io here it's going to be generated variations, no doubt. And then you have a pre-processing, you have a model inference, and then you have a post-processing. There's a quite a few uh, potential things here. That's the third one I, I want to sh uh, show here is the variation is another big thing for the companies, OEMs, when they make a choice to whether or not deploy this algorithm. Okay. Then we will move on to the challenge of four. It's what I call the diminishing or in the optimization. What does this mean is when I was talking to several colleagues, I, they told me when I asked them, what are you working on? They said, well, look, we work on how do I detect the traffic at night? Yes, traffic at night is very important for autonomous vehicle driving. You, you, you need to detect the uh, uh, traffic at night. But as of today, at least to my knowledge, we found out that what most of this common algorithm in a nice weather already hitting a very, very good one. Okay, when I say that, in a good weather, it's probably already 98, 98, 99. So the chance for, for somebody who come with a new algorithm to handle this type of spatial conditions, like a snow cover of the, of the red light, or maybe in front of you, there's a sun is it's in front of your eyes. How much, what's the possibility that you can actually detect this is a big challenge. So you, and you probably need to spend a tons of time and also a lot of computing power in order to improve that 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 right so here is the challenge four i mentioned here is so why do we need to continue to do this so what you are doing probably is already hitting a point that you if some other technology can easily to do that for example in our lab we developed this kind of smart intersection we have this uh, why you know use light uh, camera is here with with a controller uh, you know traffic light with the rcd you know dsrc cb2x so basically, I don't need to detect anything to this point that you know they can just sending a signal. They can tell the, all the incoming vehicles who can understanding this signal. They go and tell you, aha, uh -huh, there is a traffic light right now is red, and it will be uh, within next uh, 16 seconds. So you don't need to do any detection. This one is already in your, you know, is already on your, in your system. So when I say this is. I don't, I'm not arguing this, uh, you know, communication driven is perfect. This communication driven, there's a problem, which means they need a high investment on infrastructure, which in a short period of time is impossible. So, but let's just give you an idea that, are you choosing to continue working on this traffic light to handle that the last 1% or you are interested to do something else? You know, that's, that was my point because to, to handle that, you know, do you know that with human beings, how do we handle them? If you see there's a, fa there a song facing your, uh, your eyes, you, you basically slow down. Even if there's a heavy rain on, on the highway, what do you do? You park your car next to it, just waiting, waiting there until the rain you know, just goes. So that, that might be uh, some other solutions. You know, it's kind of interesting things that uh, uh, what we are talking about. Last challenge here is real-world deployment. Real-world deployment is very interesting because as I mentioned, uh, the first one, latency is important, but we even assume that your algorithm, the time to do that is zero. Do you think that you're gonna be perfect? Not necessary, because 
Maybe you can detect the uh, potential in front of you in zero seconds, 100 accuracy. But to the reality is not, you need to think about is eventually is a vehicle, is a physical system. For example, here this table shows that we've uh, on a vehicle on the five different type of vehicles, you have acceleration, braking, and, and steering. For example, you make a chair. Each of this is going to take in time. You know, the, it's taking like, a, for example, at least at 100 milliseconds level. So if you, by the time you detect it, even you, you super fast, right? But if you don't give the physical vehicle enough time, you still not going to happen. Usually, if you take it too fast, your car probably going to roll over. Or if you don't, you know, there's a, other challenges. So here is, is really about the end of the end latency. You have the computing is here, and then there's a communication even within the vehicle, and then plus the control system here. So those are an, another challenge here is, it's good for you to be aware of this because otherwise the algorithm probably, when you're talking to this OEM to ask them to deploy your system. So they're probably gonna say, well, you know, we can't really deploy this immediately. Okay, I think I covered, I will take you very quickly to show you that, uh, yeah, just in case, after this talk, some of you are interested in, oh, I want to work on the vehicles, and if you need to find a potential collaborators, then here, you know, we are open to, to all kinds of collaborations. So for example, uh, those are the hardware infrastructure we have built in the last uh, five years. So ranging from the indoors all the way to the, on the road, you know, the different vehicles. And then, uh, I don't have time here to talk about, but one of the work we have been doing is, how do we, Going to be, uh, you know, take advantage of, as I mentioned, about the latency. So when we dig inside to so this kind of deep learning models, if we found one of the frame, by the time even you make a decision, it's too late. We just throw the frame away. That was the key idea of this. So we call the profit in the public last year. So we can release this, this, um, re, you know, get rid of this kind of frame as early as possible. So we can save the energy, save the time, uh, you know, down the pipeline. So. Uh, and this is another platform we are doing. And then obviously for a vehicle, you have multiple v uh, views, right? You have a LiDAR, you have a radar, and you have a camera. Each of them is continually developing the latest technology. So I think now future might be have a LiDAR can do an image, have a camera can do a LiDAR, you know, point the cloud. You know, then how you're gonna be combine this data together with the synchronization, that was another issue you, you know, we are actively working on. So the last thing uh, we are very, actively working on to generate an AV suite so that the people can really use it to do the evaluation for the different framework in terms of time, accuracy, failure, and energy. energy. This is still a going work. I still need to work on that. Um, here is just to show you, uh, we are actively working with many OEMs uh, and also the different tier one, tier two suppliers, uh, just to show you that, you know, on the left side is a figure where the UD, we have a star campus. This is a, is, a, is a fast growing campus, so we can running our uh, autonomous vehicle here to run a test. So on the, on, the, on the lower right side is what we call the D-star. Basically, it's this uh, physical campus. So we, this is what we are uh, doing right now. So yeah, this is an ECAT. In case there's anybody is from the uh, industry, if you're interested in looking for collaborations, I, uh, I recently just been funded at NSF IUCRC Center is we are looking for collaboration with the industry people uh, to provide the world-class industry university research center for sustainable mobility. Okay, I will stop here uh, so that uh, I don't know if I have any time, but in case you have any questions, I don't have time to answer today. So here is uh, all the papers I mentioned on our website, and then you can send me an email so in case you have any questions you want to ask. Okay, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, you, uh, are you okay to take a question or two, or would you have to leave? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I can take I think I'm a perfectly studying 30 minutes, and the part told me 30 minutes, five minutes for QA. So I'm waiting okay. here. If uh, you have there, questions. Any, any questions? Yes. Uh, do you want to come up to the mic and, yeah. Would you like to come up to the mic and ask the questions so that he can hear you? Can you hear me? Can you hear the question? Maybe come to this mic or 
sorry. <laughs> I see there's a truck behind you. Is that a real truck? Uh, no, I think this is a virtual background. <laughs> oh, I see that's an autonomous truck. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, quite interesting to see and to think out of the box. Uh, you pinpointed some uh, possible direction to go, but uh, mm. I think one of the concern that came directly is the safety concern. Uh, mm. in multiple of what you propose, for example, the the light uh, having a communication between the car and the light telling it when it's going to turn red or uh, green to make a decision. Uh, if a third user come and break this communication or uh, uh, give a false value, then we start creating uh, dramatic scenarios that can occur and hence also different uh, liability for who is responsible of this kind of accident. Also, letting the cars being connected to internet can also create the same kind of breach in security and then have <coughs> uh, yeah it's kind of uh, one of the two questions i had uh, when listening to your talk or remarks uh, how as a expert in communication system how do you think we can deal with this kind of cases good I, i'm glad you know i I explain this question actually has come from a traditional networking system conference, <laughs> but here is, uh, I think that's a very good one. I can tell you some good news. You, you know, one of my students recently just demonstrated this at Orlando, you know, for the Florida Department of Transportation. Well, in case uh, Florida is one of the states in the United States, um, they exactly implement this function. All the communications are encrypted, first of all, so that uh, we will make sure that uh, this will be incremental, just like today when you go to online shopping. Are you scared? You, you do, right? Because there is a possibility. Uh, in the real system, we already have this a security, a basic security protocol in place. The other thing is, what happens if there is a wrong signal coming from them? That is, uh, there is a possibility. Yeah, that's one of the, the bigger challenges faced by the connected vehicles. Because once the vehicle starting connected, for you, you probably already read some news. Some of these trying to remote the start your vehicle, right? And then you saw the news the, uh, earlier this year, or maybe last, uh, later last year, one of the Tesla's owners cannot open a vehicle because the cloud service is not running. So those are the common things. Even you don't do anything today, it's already coming to that because once your car is connected, it's a, it, but that's a huge research issue itself. Uh, people in the, uh, Security communities. I do have one of the students actually will publish paper on the CCS. You know, that's a security conferences. That is what this, those communities really worry about. But you are right. This is indeed it's a big, uh, it's a challenge. And who is responsible for this, uh, for this? That's another good question. That's why some of the insurance company now is a step in interested in this. So in US side, for example, State Farm, Triple A, they are all involved from the beginning. Uh, of this kind of uh, uh, things now, yeah. So it, it's going to be continuously moving forward. You know, it's not like a, you are waiting for some something else is ready then to deploy the new technology. I think the things is just moving uh, in parallel. Yeah, but those are really good questions. Are there any other questions here, Nemanja? So thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, a, lot Thank of, you. a lot of challenges that you mentioned it doesn't seem that they, it can be solved purely by the companies or researchers. It seems that there's a lot of government involved, like the the connection, the connected infrastructure, even yeah, better infrastructure for communication seems very expensive. So, is there is there any any um, other challenges on that side from the from the um, yeah, for in, in, in for the government side. and government and giving support from the government side. That seems to be yes. like a number six challenge. Or, or what's your what's your thought it, on that? It, yeah, you are right. I I think that uh, uh, interesting thing here is, for example, at my previous institution, uh, funded by Michigan uh, State Government, we already deployed the CB2 as covered the whole campus. What happened is, uh, I as I just mentioned, you know, for example, F dot. 
for some for some states, which is, uh, you know, uh, probably financially is doing good, they're already starting deploying this in in, in uh, gradually. So it's uh, you are right. It, it's it's not we don't expect that they're going to be there all of a sudden, right? So, uh, just one year or two year, but down the road, this is the most likely is possible. So I want to give you an example. For example, back back to a twenty almost twenty uh, years, even longer years ago, when I lived in New Jersey, we just we just started the Easy Pass. At that time, people were talking about the, the Easy Pass. Every time we pass it, we have to drive very slow. It's in less than ten miles. Now, twenty years later, pretty much uh, the all the east east coast, all the way to Illinois, Chicago. Now, you just have one Easy Pass. You can pretty much drive anywhere. Now. And then you can drive in a full speed, even 70, 80 miles. Of, of, yeah, it's taken 20 years, right? It's not, it's not all of a sudden it's going to happen. But uh, government actually buy this idea. You can't believe that. Many of these uh, state governments, they're willing to invest on this. So basically on the transportation, one is obviously on the electrical EV charge. That is important for them to do. It. The second one is deploy this kind of uh, future infrastructure. If you go to a US DOT Department of Transportation, each year there is a lot of talks. Uh, you know, it's a federal, state, and the, and the local government is talking about to do this investment. Um, in a small city behind my my background here, small, uh, you know, where you know, what Delaware is Newark. You know, the the the, uh, the director for the urban planning, director for the development, actually, is it every time when I talk to them, you know, Delaware Department of Transportation, talking to them. You can't believe it. they are even more eager to new technology than I do. So that was something I feel very excited about this. You know, the, the, the people already realize that, it's, you know, it's, but it's not going to be happen uh, in one night. It's going to take a while, but it, it will be there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your participation in the workshop and the excellent talk. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. And Thank you so much. I wish you the best for the for the talk. So it's already us seven o'clock here. I need to go to have dinner now. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I will come back. You know, when I'm back, if you can still running, so I can attend some other talks. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Sure. Bye bye. Um. Okay, we can proceed with the next uh, next segment of lightning talks. There are two talks in this segment. Um, the first one is from the Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute and Korea University, CIPF. Yeah, would you? Yeah, it's coming next week. Um, a new version of the slides. Let me just download this new version of slides. Is it? Yes. big yeah, it's quite large uh -huh. taking, taking some time okay some technical problems sorry about it can you just play it here or no or are you going to download it uh here yeah uh, it's okay my work here uh i i just do one two no i see i see i see yeah. i see everything Okay, I think we should be good then. Oh, wait. Failed. Yes. Hmm. Okay, we will yeah, we'll play I here. Just present this. Uh, 
I gotta fix this. We go here. <clears throat> Sorry about this. So I just scroll. Wait, I just come on. Not working. I don't know what's going on. Worked earlier. No, it's actually right. Sorry about this. Okay, now, now you can see it, right? And I can share my screen. Okay. And just to I put this on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I just click here now. Oh, okay. Thank you for okay. that. Hello, I am Jasok Kam from Metri in South Korea. The title of the paper that I will present at today's precognition workshop is CIPF Crossing Intention Prediction Network Based on Feature Fusion Modules for Improving Pedestrian Safety. Uh, introduction uh, with the advancement of autonomous driving technology there has been a growing focus on the safety and convenience of pedestrians uh, in this context the ability to predict in advance whether a pedestrian intends to cross or not cross uh, is a crucial technology for pedestrian safety however predicting pedestrian crossing intention is a challenging research topic due to ambiguous human intention and the influence of external factors Various data sets such as STIP, Euro PVI, Titan, and PIE have been publicized available in relation to pedestrian behavior prediction. However, there is a lack of networks that effectively integrate diverse input features. To overcome previous limitations, we propose a novel fusion approach for uh, using all available input features for anticipating pedestrian crossing intention. This is the overall conceptual diagram of the proposed model in this paper. The proposed CIPF model consists of three modules, observational module, contextual module, and convolutional module. These modules are <clears throat> designed to receive eight inputs and prediction accuracy achieved 91%, which is the state of the art value. To predict, we define the start of the observation as the experimental start frame, and the start of the prediction after observation is the critical frame and the interval between them as the observation length. And additionally, we define the extra moment of the pedestrian crossing as the crossing frame and the interval between them as the prediction time. Uh, so this is the contribution of our paper. For pedestrian crossing intention prediction, JAAD was first introduced at the ICSV workshop in 2017, but it had limitations in dealing with a large number of pedestrian samples. Therefore, the largest scale PIA dataset was released at ICSV 2019, and various, various models such as SFGRU, PCPA, and MCIP have been developed using this dataset. This is the overall structure of the, our proposed model. The key point is the integration of eight input features and the division into three modules for the proposed CIPF. The observational module receives three inputs, pose, bounding box, and echo vehicle speed. Pose is extracted as an 18 key point vector of 36 dimensions and bounding box consists of the coordinates of the top left and bottom right corner 
and algorithmic speed information is obtained from annotations. The contextual model takes in local context, global context, and scene context as inputs, extracts features using CNN, and passes them through GRU. Local context is an image of 1.5 times of the bounding, uh, um, uh, bounding box, and global context is the seg semantic segmentation, and scene context represents an uh, entire image. The convolutional module receives inputs of local box and local surround, extracts features using C3D, and repeatedly passes them through uh, explaining layers. Local box is an image of the same size as the bounding box, and local surround is an image that is 1.5 times the size of the bounding box with the bounding box area grayed out. Each module goes through GRU, and furthermore, the input features also go through the attention module for better, better analysis. The PIE dataset consists of 1,842 pedestrians captured in Toronto, Canada. And the metrics used in the experiment are accuracy, F1 score, and AUC. The formula for calculating each of them are explained. Uh, and this is the parameters. Uh, we compared our proposed CIPF with five other benchmark models, single RNN, multi-RNN, SFRNN, PCP, and MCIP. Uh, each model uses different visual encoders and different input features. The comparison research showed that CIPF achieved the highest accuracy of 91% accuracy. Qualitative research. Green boxes indicate pedestrians with crossing intentions, while red boxes indicate pedestrians without crossing intentions. For each case, the predicted results from time frame T minus 15 to T and the actual pedestrian behavior at time frame T plus one are compared. Ablation studies research for each input bounding box had the most segment significant impact on accuracy while same context had the least impact. Uh, the results of replacing the visual encoder from C3D to VGG for the two features in the convolutional module, local box and local surround, indicated a decrease in accuracy by approximately 1% to 2%. We compared the prediction results between CIPF and MCIP by increasing the prediction time from one second to four seconds. As, a, as the prediction time increased, the accuracy decreased, and overall CIPF showed similar or higher accuracy compared to MCIP. Conclusion, we proposed the new feature fusion model CIPF and performed uh, pedestrian crossing intention prediction using this model. As a result, our prediction accuracy achieved the state of the arts and, and additional ablation studies demonstrated the effectiveness of our model. We believe that our network can make a significant contribution to improving pedestrian safety. And this is a reference. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Yes. So um, you show that uh, your model actually uses way more features than the other model. I mean, it's really fun. Uh, so what, what are, what's the comparison in terms of latency uh, compared to the baseline? Uh, you, you, you use much more complex networks. Yeah, well, more complex networks than baselines. Uh, for example, SF uh, single RNN. Is, is used to only two inputs, but our models use eight input features. So the accuracy was higher than. Uh, but you mentioned that also you, that the idea would be to use this on, on the road. Yes. In terms of later piece, is it is the latency acceptable for, for onboard deployment? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, it is a relationship of trade off uh, between uh, the accuracy and uh, accuracy and the time spent. Uh, but uh, we just used the uh, 
uh, more inputs for higher accuracy, but latency is some uh, longer than any other benchmark data set. But uh, so we, we, we just uh, more research for uh, reduce the latency. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And I think our final, oops, no. Do you want, do you would like sure. to use your? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you.
Okay, um, we are approaching an end of our, of our workshop. Um, just... Hopefully this is shared.
Can you see this on Zoom? No, it's not good. Okay, now I think it's it's looking good. So this completed our last session of uh, lightning talks, and we are moving ahead with. We are moving ahead. Hmm. Uh, we are going ahead with our last invited talk as well. So we have uh, Juan Carlos Nieves is is providing a talk on procedural knowledge and instructional video understanding. Uh, Juan Carlos is on Zoom, however, he was he was not able to to uh, join us here in person, although he was planning to. Uh, so we will have a recording of of his talk, and then uh, Q and A will be live. So professor will be here to um, to answer any questions. With that in mind, uh, let's move ahead. Actually, I failed to introduce the professor. So sorry about that. Uh, sorry to you and to, and to professor. Uh, Juan Carlos Nieblas uh, received an engineering degree in electronics from Universidad del Norte in, from Colombia in 20, 2002, and a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Illinois at, at Urbana-Champaign in 2007, and PhD degree in electric engineering from Princeton University in 2011. He is a principal researcher at Salesforce and adjunct professor of computer science at Stanford since 2021. He's co-director of the Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. Before that, he was associate director of research at the Stanford Toyota Center for AI Research and senior research scientist at the Stanford AI Lab between 2015 and 2021. He was also an associate professor of electrical and electronic engineering in Universidad del Norte, Colombia, between 2011 and 2019. His research interests are in computer vision and machine learning, with a focus on visual recognition and understanding of human action and activities, objects, scenes, and events. He serves in, as area chair for the top computer vision conferences, CVPR and ICCD, as well as associate editor for IEEE uh, TP, TPAMI. He's also a member of the AI Index Steering Committee and is the curriculum director of Stanford AI for All. He's a recipient of Google Faculty Research Award in 2015, um, the, the Microsoft Faculty Fellowship 2012, a Google Research Award 2011, and a Fulbright Fellowship 2005. So uh, let us continue after the introduction. Again, many thanks to Juan Carlos and Nielis for providing us a recording while being while having this trouble with with the with the trip so let me start by sharing a little about you perhaps some of you are like me that enjoy finishing food and from time to time i might venture in the kitchen to prepare something nice however no matter how set our expectations i have to face the reality of my current food it is not often that i end up disappointed by that event but putting this behind, if it is AI to come to the rescue, but if we have an easy access to a coach or a virtual assistant that could monitor our progress with important tasks and give us feedback, I think that this of technology in the future will benefit from understanding in detail by chance tasks of user and be performed by people in environment so that they can proactively assist. So teachers in a precise and contextualized manner. Of course, cooking is not the only domain that is very helpful. We can imagine such tasks as systems being rather than delaying, which is prepared, and making, cleaning, or 
as input to the computation model, which performs then multiple jobs in procedural and mechanical tasks, such as recognizing the computer task, recognizing the current steps of the task, and forecasting the future steps. Okay, now let's look at some quality of the result. How good are the generated two labels that we use in this case? Here, given that the difference with the corresponding subtitle, we also show a subgraph of the procedural knowledge graph that uh, is very much to this uh, user. Okay. The two labels that we generate from this uh, graph are the following. First, for video dot matching, we highlight in red the nodes that the nodes that best match the current user set. So for the video dot match, the the three that match nodes are applying all the resources there and apply that to the pair for this result that we require. You see they are quite perfect to the concept of that node. Second, we also have with the task matching, which means predict the tasks that are related to the best matching node. So here we would say uh, we would predict that the task that she's applying has performance for her or to her match for this. Okay, so that encourages the model to learn mapping for the current steps to potential tasks for the future ones. And here for the visualization, I have node vision learning, which is about predicting the previous or next step. So in this case, previous steps are existing in blue. So all the previous steps um, that could uh, come for this group that we just looking at are in blue here. And also the next steps which are in red. So then this encourages the model to predict uh, potentialized steps uh, information about the potential uh, transition between prior and next steps. Okay, this is an example of the knowledge that we can now derive from the engaging and the lead set in the red set. We also wanted to see that to compare our methods to the set of the art. We perform downstream evaluation on two very challenging cases, point and cross task. And we looked at uh, three procedural understanding tasks <laughs> task recognition, step recognition, and step forecast. In this case, we took a transformer as the downstream task model. We see that Fabrica actually improved over the baseline on all the procedural understanding tasks. To a better extraction of procedural knowledge as supported by the CPG data. Now we can see that this uh, is also possible because we can use a simpler downstream task model, which is an NLP, and uh, we can get the similar kind of data. Clearly, because Fabrica learns that features that are very rich in procedural knowledge, so that is easy to uh, perform well on these downstream tasks, given this nice. Finally, we also perform this evaluation study looking at the contribution of all these four main objectives. And we will add this training to recap in selecting only one of, the, of each uh, different objective by class. Then we complete this performance metric uh, that we are taking a color based uh, visualization to compare the overall performance to this. And in this case, green means uh, better overall performance. Overall, what we, we observe is that non relation learning is the most powerful deep learning objective. And this may be because it deeply explores the structure transition uh, from the set procedure knowledge graph and eliminates the procedural knowledge of the core order and relation of cross task steps okay, in blue. Okay, when we combine, uh, so here uh, in this uh, work, what we did is we combine procedural knowledge from instructional text and unlabeled videos to form our procedural knowledge graph with the lead. Then we use PPG to provide simple labels and to supervise the pre-training of Paprika, our procedure aware representation. 
we see that the prepared tool for the state of the art on multiple instruction videos, uh, which we are which kind of getting to that. Okay, so with that, uh, today I've talked about two important challenges that we have to solve to enable our future AI assistance. First, we look at extracting machine learning knowledge from the data information. And second, we see how we can build models that can operate on videos that can fit partial executions that are able to recognize tasks we perform, recognize the current steps we need to pass, and predict and forecast the next step given the partial execution. Okay, so that's all I'm going to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nieblas. Um, we have Professor here in Zoom, as I mentioned. Let's see, do we have any questions? Uh, we do, just, to, just to, let me just confirm that the Professor is here. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, excellent. Excellent. Okay, let's, uh, we have a question. Uh, yes, we can try that. Um, hello, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, I wonder whether you can distinguish uh, dependencies in your graph uh, and uh, um, or if you can comment, say, on uh, how to distinguish dependencies in a graph uh, from, uh, for example, variants uh, of the procedure that you may have. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, am I able to share my screen or... Yeah, you should be able. We we see. Okay. We see. Okay. Let me let me just make sure. Maybe it's helpful to look at some slides. Uh, while, okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, and you see the full the slide full screen, correct? Uh, yes, the first oh. the slide. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So this is a good question. Um, indeed, I mentioned a couple of times about um, dependencies and. In this, in this first type of work, uh, what we did was just really uh, create links between language references. And a language that references is different to a dependency in the causal sense. So I think that there is definitely a gap uh, between just utilizing um, this uh, language reference uh, pointers or connections and the actual dependencies you know, the causal dependencies or physical dependencies between steps. So I think there's a gap here we, that we definitely need to look at. And um, so, so that's one part of the question. Um, uh, and the other part is, um, I guess uh, maybe we can look at this again here. In this setting, we have a similar situation. Uh, instead of uh, looking at links between steps from the language uh, reference perspective, we simply, look at step transitions as they happen one after the other. So we just look at things in a sequence and connect the, you know, the current step to the next step. So here, the dependencies are also not uh, strictly causal. You know, you may be changing the order in which you do things as you have explained and, um, and therefore, uh, you know, achieve the same goal with different orderings. So I think in this current uh, methodology, um, since we are kind of aggregating the observations from different demonstrations in, into a single graph, we may be able to capture different ways of executing the task. It may happen because, you know, maybe I have two videos about making coffee and in one video I would be, I would grind the coffee before I steam the milk, for instance, right? So it, it may be that these paths would have different, slightly different order. And in fact, that's that's what we see in practice. You can see it sometimes um, here at the bottom, uh, links between nodes that are creating loops and uh, clearly are not a single sequence of steps, right? And that, that's because uh, in different uh, sources of information, maybe it's an article about the task or a few videos that we have uh, looked at for that specific task we observe uh, different orders in which to accomplish the goal. So we didn't do anything specifically to handle the situation of 
potential variations in or in step uh, order or step orders or different orders of step execution. Um, but I do think you know we are able to capture a little bit of it. I think there's still more to do, uh, both in the point of uh, of causal dependencies between steps as well as uh, better capturing the variation. Uh, you know, here this kind of graph structure loops may create a problem. Uh, so it may be that uh, you know even even more augmented representation may be needed to better handle uh, those uh, you know ordering variations. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Very clear. Thanks a lot. Do we have any other questions? Uh, we have one more question. Uh, hi, Professor. Thanks for your talk. It's uh, awesome work. And uh, I have a question. Um, so the data set you were using, it's mostly um, um, each sample is kind of like a one task at a time. Uh, but do you, do you have any thoughts um, when there are two tasks are performed interleaved and how, how the, this method will work or any insights about that situation? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Indeed, um, we have a few data sets here. Um, on the training side, we have the WikiHow articles, which each article is about a single procedure. And then on the visual side, we have the how to 100 million data set, which is mostly about a single task being executed. And that's true in training, but also when we apply the model in the downstream tasks, we have these two other data sets, the coin and uh, the cross task. They are also mostly about a single, um, a single task. So how to handle multiple tasks? I think we have to look at both training and testing. And um, in training time, uh, at least for this particular model, we would need to make sure that, uh, yeah, I think the way we construct the graph right now cannot directly handle two tasks at the same time, because the way we do it, it would just create a single chain for all the steps that are observed in the video. And uh, we may not be able to disambiguate which steps belong to which task. Um, so during training, that may be difficult to handle with the current uh, framework. But at testing time, um, because you at this time, at testing time, you can basically observe the video a piece at a time. So as you are seeing the video happening, each video segment happening, you may be able to notice that, okay, maybe there is a subset of the video segments that belong to one task. There's another subset that belongs to a second task. And after the model is trained, you may be able to do some kind of parsing that disentangles these, these two interleaves, uh, interleaved uh, tasks. But again, we didn't do any any experimentation on this, so um, I'm I'm just going from the intuition uh, of our the capability of our model. Um, I think this is an interesting question. I think for training, you may be able to acquire enough data that's a single task, but at testing time, especially if we are building this type of AI assistant I was talking about at the beginning. You know, people usually tend to do many things at a time. They will be multitasking. You know, preparing coffee, preparing. Uh, maybe uh, a, a breakfast uh, omelet or something. And, and you know maybe trying to achieve multiple goals at the same time. So I think it's definitely important to handle that situation at the inference time. And, uh, but we, yeah, we didn't do anything special to, to try to solve it, yeah. Thank you, that's a great insight. And also I think maybe another challenge is uh, we need a, a data set to evaluate the, this kind of multitask scenario we for a lack of the data set for that. Thanks for that. And I have another question is uh, for this pre-training, um, how, how much computation resources you use for this pre-training? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, our pre-training is not too expensive because uh, the block in blue here, uh, E, is a frozen pre-train general purpose video foundation model. So we can use a pre-train large model for video and our procedure aware model it's a lightweight ad adaptation so it's a few layers to try to induce the procedural knowledge into the representation 
Um, so that means, you know, for most of our experimentations and running, you know, multiple experiments at a time, we simply use like an eight GPU machine uh, without, uh, yeah, nothing, nothing special. This is pretty much a lightweight training. Yeah. Uh, lightweight nowadays. I mean, <laughs> thank you. That's, uh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I do have a one last question. Uh, uh, do you have any experiments shows the like inference time? Um, like can, can this during during the inference can it be running in the real time? Yeah, that's a great question. I did not. I don't have numbers for this. I think my um, my uh, estimation right now uh, is that the majority of the time is spent on the general purpose video model that's frozen here. And that's the majority of the computation. So if we can use a lightweight video representation model, I think, uh, yeah, we can achieve uh, fast processing. Um, you know, I, in my own work, I've done some work in the past to build lightweight video representation. So we can definitely achieve you know, many, many frames per second uh, processing time on input video and achieve real time processing. Um, of course, you know, the faster methods tend to be less accurate than the more powerful compute computationally heavy methods. For this particular paper, we didn't um, push for a fast computation uh, at inference time. So we simply froze the you know, the foundation model here, the general purpose represent, uh, video representation here and um, and kept it as is. But yeah, this is something that could could be addressed uh, by replacing it. I see, thank you. Um, yeah, that's all my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's stop here and thank the speaker. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much for having me. Um, that completes our invited talks as well. And uh, we are moving ahead uh, with uh, closing the workshop. Uh, let me just go back here. Oh, yep, it's here. Let me just share my screen. Bottom left. Where, where should I put? Uh, bottom left. Yep. There. There. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So closing remarks, and I already spoiled the punchline a little bit. <laughs> um, but uh, firstly, um, you know, we we do have a best paper announcement. We did not unfortunately get uh, funded for. Uh, for a prize this year, but we still would like to to call out uh, best practices for two D body two for two body pose forecasting from the Sapienza University of Rome. So congratulations to them. Um, and we do we have anyone from? No, I, I, oh here you are. All right, congratulations. Okay. Absolutely, we would love that. Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is the, the fifth time that we've held this workshop, um, and, and it's, it's gone 
well despite despite a few hiccups with you know people not unable to make it and things like that uh but we're glad that it seems to have gone smoothly and has been well received it definitely takes a lot of people to bring bring a workshop like this together so we want to thank firstly all of the authors everyone who submitted their work to this to this workshop you know a lot of very very good work was submitted a lot of very good work was showcased today uh, so we do want to appreciate all of the effort that that you've put into that um, all of the invited speakers who, who gave such wonderful talks today as well uh, you know uh, went out of their way they were long talks uh, a lot we saw really cool visuals i was very impressed by by some of that as uh, as well um, the the program committee uh, committee members who put in all of their time this is thankless unpaid time uh, you know it's a, in academia to to review uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the work and provide opinions and feedback and help improve prove a lot of this this work that's going on um, all of you attendees both uh, both on uh, remote attendees on zoom as well as as those uh, who attended in person thank you for for all the questions and all of the engagement that that happened today um, the CVPR workshop chairs, uh, you know, this year, Olga, Serena, and you who, uh, you know, continue to support this, this workshop uh, year after year. Um, so we're, we're grateful to that. Uh, and CVPR organizers, of course, for making this conference happen. Um, and of course, all of the, my co-organizers here, um, you know, Kwa, Nemanja, uh, Chris, uh, Kian, uh, Junwe, uh, everyone who's who's helped, helped make this happen. Um, so uh, thanks thanks to everybody. I just want to like give a give a hand to everyone who helped make this happen. The videos and slides of all of the all of the full papers, uh, you know, in addition to to the presentations here today, there were also videos for all of the all of the uh, talk, these talks. Um, and so all of that with the extended abstracts will be shared on the website. I think you should be able to see it later today. Um, so all of that material will be available to you. The Zoom recording itself, I believe, uh, I believe the Zoom is recorded and will be made available to CVPR registered attendees. Um, don't hold me to that. I think it's the CVPR or, uh, organization that's, that's, uh, that's doing that for us so so this this will this will all be recorded and be available to attendees for a while um and you know i i think that's it we hopefully will see you all uh we'll have this again next year and we'll see you all next year with even more uh you know wonderful work showcased and more discussions on on visual predictions thanks everyone Sorry? Yeah. Let's make sure we're off.